Hello, folks, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to talk about another intellectual property lawsuit. And I think one that took people by surprise this past weekend. It's Nintendo, the makers of the Nintendo Switch, and of course the Wii and Nintendo 64 and Super NES before it, that are suing emulator makers of Yuzu, the Yuzu emulator. And I believe they're their company is named Tropic something. I want to say Tropic Freeze because that's a Nintendo game, but it's not called Tropic Freeze. So we'll get to that in just a moment. But one of the reasons that videos get flagged for me to make in this space is when I get a lot of questions asked about them. And over this past weekend, when this lawsuit was discovered by Stephen Totillo uh, and his blog, I think it's called Game File right now, but formerly of Axios, formerly of Kotaku, formerly of MTV, I believe, uh, he found this lawsuit that Nintendo had filed against the company that makes Yuzu. And I started getting a lot of questions from folks at various journalistic outlets saying, essentially, my people are telling me or I'm getting comments from my followers that say that this lawsuit is bunk and Nintendo has no chance at this. Could you take a look at it real quick and let me know what you think? And of course, on a Sunday or Saturday or whatever day of the weekend I was looking at this, I'm not terribly enthused about looking through a 40-page legal document, but I want to help get more and better information out there. So I said, sure, I'll take a look. And I went through this and I was looking for a certain number of things to see if this made sense as a lawsuit. And I saw those things and I gave some quotes to people, some of which we'll go over in this video. It said, hey, I don't think Nintendo is out of its mind here. Now that's going to take a lot of background information. We're going to go through a couple of laws here so that we can hopefully have a good understanding of what I was looking for why I saw it and what Nintendo pled, why that means that Nintendo is probably not going to get kicked right out of court. It also doesn't mean that they'll necessarily win at the end of the day. But like any good lawyer, we're going to look at this from both directions and see what we can see on a question of some variability. So I did a poll right before this episode started asking whether you thought Nintendo had a case. About half of you said that you thought they had a case. Half of you said, I didn't know they were suing anybody. Only a couple of people said, hey, they're out of their darn minds. And that is good reflection of this community, I think, because I wouldn't say any of these questions we're about to look at today are obvious in answer. So on that note, let's get some background on the intellectual property laws of the United States, because that's what we're going to be looking at as part of this lawsuit. So first, we start out with the most basic. I think you've probably seen this screen if you've been in virtual reality before a number of times. And that is the exclusive right and copyrighted works part of the Copyright Act. This is basically what copyright is. This is that the owner of a work that they create, whether it's The Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom, the Switch itself, or a book that they've written, has the exclusive right to reproduce that work, to prepare derivatives based upon that work, to distribute copies of that work, to perform it if it's something that can be performed, like a literary, musical, dramatic, or choreographic work, a dance, a drama, a video game in this case, to display it if it's just a picture or similar, or to perform it if it's a sound recording. So basically, if you make something in the United States it's of an intellectual property variety, if you write a book, you make a video game, you make a console, then you have the sole and exclusive right to make another one or to make a derivative of that thing. And I think people know that copyright is pretty self-descriptive as far as legal terms go. It's the right to copy. Uh, and so... When we look at these things, that copyright holder has these exclusive rights. But you might be saying, Rick, I know there's a lot of exceptions to that. And there indeed are, which is where all of these lawsuits and conversation come in. So we look at the main exception that people know in the social media space, and that is, of course, fair use. And this exception is a little bit of a problem under the law because it is not a bright line rule, meaning that it isn't something we can say you have it or you don't have it before a court goes through the entire process of evaluating it, which means if you're relying on fair use for your defense, you've got a bit of a legal problem as it stands because the court system, hiring lawyers, hiring me, hiring somebody else is an expensive process. And so if you're depending on fair use, you wind up balancing, as this statute says, the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work, which is legalese, right? But we can shorten this into understandable pros. The purpose and character of the use. Why did you steal the copyrighted work? The nature of the copyrighted work. What is it that you stole? The amount and substantiality of the portion used. How much of it did you steal? The effect of the use upon the potential market for, or, for or uh, value of the copyrighted work. 
what's it going to cost the rightful owners of that work, right? So it's it's why did you steal it? What did you steal? How much of that did you steal? And is it going to damage the person that you stole it from? And we balance those things. It's not a given that if you hit this one and not this one that you're going to be fair use or not. The court says we're going to balance this. We'll know it when we see it. And so at that point in time, you're already in a little bit of trouble. So one of the things we look at as part of these lawsuits, as part of these legal questions is, can the sewer here for Nintendo get past that initial uh, stage of dismissal, right? So if Nintendo can plead something in their court case that doesn't get it immediately thrown out of court, then the other party has a problem because they don't really want to go through this whole process and get to fair use or some of the other things we're going to talk about because that's expensive and you don't know whether you're going to win. So when you don't know you're going to win and you're going to pay lawyers for the whole process, those tend to settle because you might as well pay money or stop doing whatever it is the other party doesn't want you to be doing rather than do that at the end of a process where you've also paid lawyers and gone bankrupt probably in the process. So that's the real politic of law. It's a little bit unfortunate that that's how the justice system works, but that's realistically how any system has to work at some level, because in order to come to a conclusion on these questions, it is a process and a technical one. And we're going to talk about why, because there's about 600 different exceptions and things that we have to consider as part of this. And fair use is only one of them. Let's talk about another major one. That is section 117 here, which is specific to computer programs, which is inclusive for this purpose of video games, we'll see it in another place as part of this video where a computer program is not a video game, specifically not a video game. But for this purpose, this is what people talk about when they talk about archival. This is a question that was asked of me a number of times in email and otherwise. It said, Rick, what about archival? What about things that are accepted from these various rules? And that is section 117 here says, notwithstanding the provisions of section 106, notwithstanding whatever exclusive rights someone has to the copyrighted materials that they make, it is not an infringement for the owner of a copy of a computer program to make or authorize the making of another copy or adaptation of that computer program, provided one, that such a new copy or adaptation is created as an essential step in the utilization of the computer program in conjunction with a machine and that it is used in no other manner. That's not really what we're talking about here. Or that such new copy or adaptation is for archival purposes only and that all archival copies are destroyed in the event that continued possession of the computer program should cease to be rightful. And this is what people mostly are talking about when they talk about emulators and ROMs and things that they think are okay, which is to say, I own a copy. A lot of people you see on Twitch sometimes hold up the copy that they own physically of an older program on the Game Boy or the Super Nintendo or what have you. And they say, this law says I'm allowed to dump that from the cartridge onto my computer as long as it's for archival purposes only. Now note, only is a pretty strong word in the law, so holding up that SNES cartridge or that Game Boy cartridge or whatever to go on Twitch with your emulation probably isn't successful specifically under the statute because that's not archiving anymore. That is performing or displaying it uh, and is potentially another problem that you have with copyright infringement. Although we've also talked about largesse in this space and no video game company is likely to come after you for those things unless and until they want to market that program separately as a remake or a remaster of an older product that they have the copyrights to, which is of course why video games is a little bit more unusual than computer games as an economic environment because of that continued market for essentially retro remakes and things of that nature, which Nintendo knows well and good. So that being said, it's also important to note that when we talk about archival, you don't see, I can make an archival copy and then put it on a ROM site. I can make an archival copy and I can then sell it. This is specifically for archiving of your own stuff, and it is not something that you can transfer separate from the physical copy that you have. In fact, the next section says, any exact copies prepared in accordance with the provisions of this section may be leased, sold, or otherwise transferred, but when? Along with the copy from which such copies were prepared, only as part of the lease, sale, or other transfer of all rights in the program. We can't have digital programs start proliferating on their own. That is, in effect, piracy. And so if you're going to make a copy for archival purposes, you can move that archival copy with the physical version of the program that you've made, but you can't just start putting this out and distributing it on the internet. Now, you don't have to agree with that law, right? I've got clients that sit across the desk from me all the time that say, but Rick, why is that? And I don't have an answer for them all the time, right? You don't have to agree with the way that this law is structured to understand that this is the way the law is written. So when you create an archival copy for yourself, 
It doesn't otherwise give you anything other than archival purposes, and you can't otherwise move it without also moving the physical copy that you have, which is all to say that we've got some exceptions here that are not as easy to understand as some people on the internet would make you believe. And they might also say, hey, Rick, but I thought emulators were perfectly legal. And I would answer, yes, basically. And they would point to things like the Connectix uh, case back in 2000 here, where we can highlight the holding instead of reading the whole case and hopefully be a little bit more understandable than going through every legal document that we can look at on these things, where we find that the court concluded that the intermediate copies Connectix made and used during the course of its reverse engineering of the BIOS program, this was a PlayStation, were protected fair use, necessary to permit Connectix to make its non-infringing virtual game station function with PlayStation games. In reaching its conclusion, the court found that three of the four fair use factors, the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for the work, all weighed in favor of fair use. Although the court found that Connectix copied the entire BIOS program, it concluded that this factor warranted very little weight in cases of intermediate infringement where the final product does not itself contain infringing material. And this is the primary case that shows that uh, emulators are okay. There's some other cases that go in other directions on specifics, like the Bleem case. You'll see all these referenced in the various articles that are being talked about on this topic of Nintendo versus Yuzu. But what's important here is the notion that you can create something that is not infringing, that otherwise operates with another party's or platform's games, like Connectix and their virtual game system, but it doesn't matter whether you've copied the entire BIOS to get that functioning if once you're done, your end product doesn't otherwise infringe on the baseline rules of the platform that you've copied. So Connectix says emulators are okay. Emulators are largely okay in the US, except we're here talking about Nintendo suing over an emulator. Why? Because this isn't the end of the story, right? We just talked about the baselines of copyright. We just talked about infringement and fair use and those kinds of things. So an emulator is okay on fair use and basic infringement, but we've got other laws. Believe me, the US has other laws, folks. And that brings us to every social media user's favorite law, the DMCA. And we're used to talking about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA, in connection with takedown notices on places like YouTube, right? The DMCA, part of it says that a platform like a YouTube or like a Twitter or Facebook can't get in trouble for the copyright infringements of its users if it responds to a takedown notice and a whole bunch of other things we talk about in other videos. But here, we're talking about a specific issue that is different from that kind of takedown and copyright infringement notice regime. And that is circumvention of copyright protection systems. So regardless of what you know from Connectix and Bleem and some other stuff and, and precedents that say emulators are, are legal in the United States, this DMCA provision comes in and says, regardless, no person shall circumvent a technological measure that effectively controls access to a work protected under this title. Said another way, if a copyright owner puts in place a technological measure that requires someone to circumvent it, which is a legal term we're going to get to in just a minute, then this provision in and of itself is violated, regardless of whether the work that you've made is infringing on the, on the original work. So if you had to circumvent a technological measure to make your emulator, you can still get in trouble specifically under this provision, even if that would be a fair use. Now, Congress isn't stupid. He says, pausing for the laugh track. So they actually put in this particular provision an out for fair use, but it's more convoluted than even the fair use provision that we just read. So they say during the two-year period described in subparagraph A, and during each succeeding three-year period, the librarian of Congress shall make the determination of whether persons who are users of a copyrighted work are or are likely to be in the succeeding three-year period adversely affected by the prohibition under subparagraph A in their ability to make non-infringing uses under this title of a particular class of copyrighted works. So let's pare that down. They say, okay, so we know we just made a new rule and people are worried about being able to fairly use copyrighted works. Say, so, well, the Library of Congress is going to take a, a look at who is having technological measures that need to be circumvented and look at particular cases where that circumvention should be allowed because the end use is not infringement or is otherwise something that should be deemed fair by the law. And you say, Rick, that doesn't seem terribly clear. And I would agree with you because when we look at what the librarian is going to evaluate, it's things like the availability of the copyrighted works, the availability for educational purposes, et cetera, and such other factors as the librarian considers appropriate. So not the tightest bit of code, 
that Congress put in place for this particular provision, but we do know that this circumvention notion has exceptions that are put forth by the Librarian of Congress. And believe me, we're going to look at some of those a little later on in this video. But worthwhile to note here that that particular exception only applies to the circumvention notice. So everything else that we're about to read is not otherwise affected by what the Librarian of Congress says. No person shall manufacture, import, offer to the public, provide, or otherwise traffic in any technology, product, service, device, component, or part thereof that A, is primarily designed or produced for the purpose of circumventing a technological measure, B, has only limited commercially significant purpose or use other than to circumvent a technological measure, or C, is marketed by that person or another acting in concert with that person with that person's knowledge for use in circumventing a technological measure. So unlike the actual circumvention being illegal, it's also illegal to traffic in any technology, product, service, device, component, or part thereof that is designed to circumvent that technological measure that only has limited other things that it can do or is marketed to circumvent that technological measure. So if you're a Yuzu or another emulator and you market yourself as a switch emulator and or something that gets around switch encryption, then you might have a problem under this provision, regardless of what the Librarian of Congress says with respect to the technological measure itself. Now, that it's, itself gets a little bit unwieldy because if the Librarian of Congress says something is otherwise allowed to circumvent a technological measure, then you probably have that kind of wheel back on itself in a continuing logical circle as to figure out whether or not you've got a problem here with the librarian on the trafficking. But what's important to note is that you can't just dismiss out of hand somebody that is going to accuse you of trafficking in something that at least on its outside looks like you're circumventing technological measures designed to prevent access to a copyrighted work. What do we mean by circumventing technological measure? It means to descramble the scrambled work. And remember these phrases, because we're going to see them in the lawsuit. To decrypt an encrypted work, or otherwise to avoid, bypass, remove, deactivate, or impair a technological measure without the authority of the copyright owner. And a technological measure effectively controls access to a work. And that's always a great phrase in this particular statute, because in my head, as a lawyer, I think, well, if it's gotten around, it wasn't a terribly effective control, right? But the, de the definition here is if in the ordinary course of its operation, that measure requires the application of information or a process or a treatment with the authority of the copyright owner to gain access to the work. And we think of these as keys, right? Decryption or otherwise that the copyright owner has used or has put in its hardware to get access to the baseline underlying copyrighted work. So a technological measure effectively controls access to a work and circumvention are the kinds of definitions that would be tested in a lawsuit, right? And one other thing I'd like to make sure everybody understands, when we look at this lawsuit, and we're about ready to jump in, this is only Nintendo's side of things, right? So if they are doing their jobs, the lawyers of Nintendo, we should get to the end of this lawsuit and think, yeah, they probably have a case because we haven't seen anything from the Tropic Haze side of things. We haven't seen anything from the Yuzu side of things. And so if this is a good pleading, we should get to the end and say, you know, that might be a violation of the laws that we just read, specifically the DMCA 1201. That's the main thing that's brought up here. And that was what I was looking for when this lawsuit was put to me, right? Emulators generally okay. You have to bring a specific claim, probably under the DMCA, in order to get around some of the precedent on emulators being okay in the United States. And so when I looked at this lawsuit, I said, okay, the Nintendo lawyers are aimed at the right thing. And greater minds than mine are going to have to look at the underlying technology and that's one thing I would warn you of is don't go to the lawyers for your technological understanding of server stacks or anything else that's happening in the world of technology. And I would point out here, we're going to look at some summaries that are made by Ars Technica and the Virgin otherwise of what's happening with Yuzu. But greater minds than mine, greater YouTube channels than mine are going to have a deeper dive into the technological questions here posed by this lawsuit. But we can definitely talk about the law. Now, that all said, I did see that a super chat came in. I want to make sure I grab those when I can. Here's Fried Melon. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. So would Yuzu be in danger due to them requiring a BIOS slash prod keys for their software, even they don't distribute it, including the games too? And yeah, we're going to talk about that, right? Because one of the questions at the heart of this case, we haven't gotten to it yet, so we're skipping ahead a little, is that unlike the Dolphin emulator that was put on Steam very briefly that was going to include, I believe it was called the Common Key, 
for we decryption, the Yuzu solution here was to say, all right, we won't include the keys. We'll make our users go get the keys themselves. Our underlying product will use those keys, but those users have to go get them. And so we should be okay on this question. And Nintendo says, no, you're not okay. And honestly, when we get to that point in the lawsuit, we'll look at that and say, Nintendo has a logical point, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily a winning point. We don't know what a court would do with that argument. But because we don't know, it means that Nintendo probably can't get laughed out of court. And that means that you use looking at legal fees either way, which probably leads to a settlement, right? If this is your first time in virtual legality, you might not know this. Other people that have been here a lot do probably know this. But in a civil case like this one, the answer nine times out of 10 is a settlement between the parties. It's one of the reasons there are so many gray areas in the law is because settlement doesn't lead to that final disposition by a court. And we're ultimately left hanging on some of these legal questions. But once you get to a position where a lot of the variables are solved, that there's a lot more knowledge of how a court case is likely to go, that transparency means that the settlement equation changes and it makes a lot more sense for one party or the other to settle with the other party because they now know that they're likely to win, they're likely to lose, and how much lawyers are going to cost to get to that final disposition. So rather than pay the lawyers, they settle for some number in the middle and then things happen from there. So if Nintendo can survive that initial summary dismissal motion, which will happen as part of this, then Yuzu starts to look at a different settlement equation and becomes more likely to settle with Nintendo, which is part of why this is a story. So let's take a look at the lawsuit itself. If you haven't read it, uh, this isn't online uh, in any obvious place that I know of. This was actually sent to me by one of those journalists that was asking questions, so I apologize for that. But we'll look at the, the material parts here. Plaintiff Nintendo of America, by and through its counsel, on personal knowledge as to its own actions and on information and belief as to the actions, capabilities, and motivations of others, hereby alleges as follows. And what's important to note here is that they allege it in the district of Rhode Island, right? Which is not some place that Nintendo is known for being. Obviously, Nintendo sells all across the world, but that's not where they're headquartered. In fact, it is where the headquarters of Tropic Haze is, at least as alleged here by Nintendo, which is an interesting choice because Nintendo means they're suing at the home base of the defendant, which, which isn't something that they have to do, right? The person that is filing the lawsuit in some ways gets to decide where they, where they file that lawsuit. And the most obvious cases there are the home bases of either the defendant or the plaintiff. They chose the defendant here. Rhode Island isn't, as far as I know, specifically understood for any a copyright reason. So they weren't forum shopping for better law. They did this because this is where Tropic Haze is located. And that's an interesting part of the story as it stands. Nintendo of America makes Nintendo games. I think we all know that. Defendant Tropic Haze LLC makes that Yuzu emulator. A video game emulator is a piece of software that allows users to unlawfully play pirated video games that were published only for a specific console on a general purpose computing device. Remember, that's Nintendo's language, right? And this is perhaps not how I would frame this here, but Nintendo is pleading to try to make their case that there's a legal cause of action to be remedied by the court. So they say, this is what an emulator is. It's a piracy machine. And even though you or I might think an emulator is a little bit more broad than that, has some legitimate legal uses. Nintendo doesn't have to offer that right at the start. It doesn't make them liars. It's just the way that you write a document like this one. To protect its intellectual property rights and investment, as well as the investments of its third-party developers, Nintendo designed the Nintendo Switch and Nintendo Switch video games with sophisticated security features or technological measures, sometimes referred to as technological protection measures or TPMs, meant to prevent people from playing unauthorized or pirated copies of Nintendo's video games whether on Nintendo Switch consoles or on other platforms. Specifically, every Nintendo Switch video game stored on a Nintendo physical cartridge or on a Nintendo Switch console as a digital download is secured with multiple technological measures, including encryption that scrambles the audiovisual content in the game file to make it unreadable without the use of proprietary cryptographic keys. And now, since we looked at the law first, you know what the lawyers are doing here with respect to this pleading. They are setting up the fact pattern that's going to lead to them claiming a violation of the DMCA 1201, right? We can see that they're talking about scrambling and encryption. We know that they're going to establish that they've got a technological measure in place. They're even using that language. In the ordinary course of operation, an authentic Nintendo Switch console will use certain cryptographic keys available to the console, commonly referred to as the prod keys, to decrypt other cryptographic keys associated with games and then use those keys to decrypt lawfully purchased games during runtime. Only if the games are dynamically decrypted during operation of the console, May the user play those games. Nintendo also has technological measures on the Nintendo Switch console itself, 
including additional layers of encryption, which prevent users from unlawfully accessing or modifying the console, including to procure the prod keys, and from accessing or copying games stored on the console or on a cartridge inserted in the console. Yuzu unlawfully circumvents the technological measures on Nintendo Switch games and allows for the play of encrypted Nintendo Switch games on devices other than a Nintendo Switch. Yuzu does this by executing code necessary to defeat Nintendo's many technological measures associated with its games, including code that decrypts the Nintendo Switch video game files immediately before and during runtime using an illegally obtained copy of prod keys. Now, note Nintendo's bit sleight of hand here, right? So you say exactly what you want to say to bring that 1201 claim. They are circumventing our techno technological measures. And that is the, the straight up legal claim that you are making. And then you say, how do they do that? Well, they're doing it because they're decrypting using their program on runtime, at, but they aren't necessarily providing the prod keys. They're doing it using an illegally obtained copy of prod keys. And then later on in this lawsuit, you'll see it's the users that obtain the prod keys, either through unlawful websites or by unlawfully hacking the Nintendo Switch console, which leads us to the question, right? They're suing Yuzu. They're not suing the users of Yuzu because that would be basically impossible. And so we get a legal question here of, Okay, if the users are the ones obtaining the prod keys, uh, is Yuzu the one that's violating the law? And that's where we really get into this legal question that people are asking, right? If the users are bringing the keys to the party, is Yuzu the ones that are violating the law? And, and Nintendo says, well, they wouldn't have anything that they've successfully stolen if this Yuzu program didn't exist and various other things that Yuzu is doing. And so they are. But that is the kind of thing that good lawyers can fight about and a judge or court will ultimately have to determine. The lead developer of user, known online under the alias Bunny, Bunny I think, has publicly acknowledged most, user, most users pirate prod keys in games online. And Yuzu's website provides instructions for its users telling them how to unlawfully hack their own Nintendo Switch and how to make unauthorized copies of Nintendo games and unlawfully obtain prod keys. Now, they use unlawfully a lot here to tell the court how they feel about this situation. They aren't actually citing anything in this particular area because they do run into the problem of USC 117 suggesting that mostly you're going to be allowed to dump things uh, if they are for archival purposes. Now, that doesn't mean you can dump them to play them on a different device. It doesn't mean you can use them for some different purpose. And that's where the unlawful probably comes in if we were to read Nintendo's mind on this pleading. But you can see they're kind of skipping a little bit of a base to present the strongest case possible. There's nothing really wrong with that, but we can note it while we read through. Only because Yuzu decrypts a Nintendo Switch game file dynamically during operation can the game be played in Yuzu. In other words, bold, so you know they're serious, without Yuzu's decryption of Nintendo's encryption, unauthorized copies of games could not be played on PCs or Android devices. With Yuzu in hand, nothing stops a user from obtaining and playing unlawful copies of virtually any game made for the Nintendo Switch, all without paying a dime to Nintendo or to any of the hundreds of other game developers and publishers making and selling games for the Nintendo Switch. In effect, Yuzu turns general computing devices into tools for massive intellectual property infringement of Nintendo and others' copyrighted works. And if we're being entirely realistic here, it turns general computing devices into possible tools for massive infringement, property infringement of Nintendo and others copyrighted works, right? But Nintendo doesn't have to offer the possibly there, it just does. Defendant employs several developers who operate as the company's agents, including Yuzu's author and lead developer, Bunny. Defendant traffics in the Yuzu software on a website, yuzu-emu.org, on github.com, and recently on Google Play. Yuzu slash emu.org provides detailed instructions and facts on how to install Yuzu and get it running with unlawful copies of Nintendo Switch games. Yuzu slash emu.org also has a blog section with regular posts about updates to the software, a list of thousands of Nintendo Switch games that Yuzu developers have tested in Yuzu and confirmed can be played, and screenshots of Nintendo Switch games being played in the emulator. Now, screenshots is definitely not a violation of the law. Nintendo's lawyers are just adding what they can to show that Yuzu is a bad actor here. We know from the Bleem case and the appeals that went through that case, again, a couple of decades ago, that screenshot showing the differences bet between how a game is emulated and how it plays on the baseline platform are not considered to be copyright infringement because they are of limited value and, and limited taking of the underlying product and all sorts of things that go into that particular case that we aren't going to worry about looking at this one. But they are just throwing what they can to show that Yuzu is a bad actor. The website additionally links to a variety of other circumvention software that can hack into the Nintendo Switch console 
including to allow users to obtain and further distribute the prod keys. So Nintendo is basically claiming something along the lines of they are in possession and sharing where things that are of a thieving nature exist, right? And you have certain amounts of legal precedent on this. You have certain amount of cases where somebody's sharing information about how to break into a safe or where lock picks are located can get that particular sharer of information in trouble. This is specific to the digital space and is essentially a bit of a novel argument uh, in that context because Yuzu is clearly trying to exist in a world that isn't otherwise been deemed illegal before now. And so Yuzu has tried, it looks like, to be legal in some important respects. And Nintendo says that's still not good enough and is up to the court to ultimately determine. Now let's take a look at how that's presented in some of the articles that I talked about earlier. Here's Ars Technica saying, how strong is Nintendo's legal case against Switch emulator Yuzu? And their sub headline says Nintendo is basically taking the position that emulation itself is unlawful. I don't think that's really fair to Nintendo, but I think even that lawyer walks that back in this article. The lawyer, John Loiterman of the Foundation Law, uh, group says Nintendo is still basically taking the position that emulation itself is unlawful, though that's not the core legal theory in this case, which is a very lawyerly way of saying, I'm going to say that quote, but I don't even think it fully. The bulk of Nintendo's legal argument rests on users' ability to break the many layers of encryption that protect Switch software from being copied and or played by author unauthorized users. By using so-called prod keys obtained from legitimate Switch hardware, Yuzu can dynamically decrypt an encrypted Switch game ROM at runtime, which Nintendo argues runs afoul of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act's prohibition against circumvention of software protections, and more specifically, the trafficking of that software, right? Because they understand, Nintendo does, that Yuzu might have some defenses on the side of them with the Library of Congress and various other things that are happening with respect to the circumvention itself. So what we'll see as part of this lawsuit is that Nintendo focuses on the trafficking the movement of information, the combining of these various tools across the internet to tell people how to do these things in a way that they might not have known of themselves. And when we look at what is illegal to be trafficked, we note that you can't traffic things that include uh, services or components of services, right? So while that generally looks to me as a lawyer as something that's intended to be an item of specificity, the actual technology, the actual code program, whatever it might be, a reasonable attorney can argue that service is broader, that component of service is even broader than that, and that if you are creating files that look like this one, that say, okay, here's what you need, here's what you need for your computer, here's how you dump those things, here's what you're looking for, here's where the programs are to get them done, then you are facilitating this circumvention of technological measures in a way that someone who's just creating something on their own and saying, bring your keys to the party, is not. So Nintendo is not out of their minds by my view of this document, even if their legal position isn't something that we can look to a specific precedent for as it stands right now. It's what we might call a novel legal argument, which is to say lawyers get paid money for good reason on some of these things. This is not something that is obvious on its face. It's also not something that can be thrown out of court. And so Nintendo is using a little bit of what we might call bully ball to see if they can get this company shut down or otherwise take control of it because they don't like it being out there. Now, is that against all emulation? Maybe you can look at it from that perspective if you're inclined to think Nintendo evil on these points. Uh, but I think this is pretty specific to putting out all this information, doing these various things, and believing themselves fully damaged by what Yuzu has put out there. Yuzu, says Nintendo, falls squarely within these DMCA provisions. Yuzu circumvents Nintendo's technological measures on its games. Thus, defendants' development and distribution of Yuzu constitutes unlawful trafficking in software primarily designed to circumvent technological measures, and the confirmed use of the emulator by Bunny and other Yuzu developers as defendants' agents to decrypt and play Nintendo games constitutes that unlawful circumvention. That's a little bit tricky because Yuzu isn't shipping with the games itself, so Nintendo's skipping that base a little bit here to talk about it, but you can see what points they are raising. Defendant and its agents' trafficking and circumvention have directly injured and damaged Nintendo, infringe and threaten irreparable injury to Nintendo's intellectual property rights, and violate the anti-circumvention and anti-trafficking provisions of the DMCA. So we're entitled to all this relief, including, as you can tell from the threaten irreparable injury language, they want equitable relief, including taking control of some of the domains that Yuzu currently controls. Nintendo authorized copies of its Nintendo Switch games to be played only on Nintendo Switch consoles. As noted above, in addition to the game technological measures, Nintendo protects its games behind additional technological measures on Nintendo Switch consoles. To get any game off a Nintendo Switch console and into the Yuzu environment to be played, 
Therefore, Bunny and other defendants agents must obtain the Nintendo Switch's cryptographic keys, the prod keys, from a hacked console, which violates Nintendo's rights under the DMCA to the console, not just the games, and make at least one unauthorized copy of a Nintendo Switch game, which, when the copied game is Nintendo's, the Legend of Zelda, whatever whatever you're interested in, Mario, violates plaintiff's right of reproduction under the Copyright Act, entitling plaintiff to the relief sought herein. So not only are they having problems with the games, which Nintendo actually has a little bit of a harder argument to make if Yuzu isn't otherwise distributing the game ROMs themselves, but they are also having problems with the console, says Nintendo, because they broke in, they needed to get access to those prod keys, and they can only actually do this with the games themselves. Indeed, in multiple U.S. federal cases, says Nintendo, courts have entered judgment proving the trafficking in devices that circumvent the technological measures of the Nintendo Switch console and Nintendo Switch games violates the DMCA. And then they bring up a number of cases where I believe those have been found. I can't promise you that because I didn't look at all of these citations, but generally speaking, the lawyers, if they're not using AI, are not going to lie about those citations. Defendant and its agents are fully aware of the use of Yuzu by others in performing circumvention and in facilitating piracy at a colossal scale. As to circumvention, Yuzu's website acknowledges that the Nintendo Switch's decryption keys are required to decrypt games and includes links to software that unlawfully extract those keys from the Nintendo Switch. As to piracy, for instance, one recent major Nintendo video game, Tears of the Kingdom, was unlawfully distributed a week and a half before its release by Nintendo. Infringing copies of the game that circulated online were able to be played in Yuzu, and those copies were successfully downloaded from pirate websites over one million times before the game was published and made available for lawful purchase by Nintendo. Many of the pirate websites specifically noted the ability to play the game file in Yuzu. Defendant's development and distribution of Yuzu to the public materially contributes to and induces those third parties to infringe the copyrights in Nintendo games. Defendant is thus secondarily liable for the infringement committed by the users to whom it distributes Yuzu. So Nintendo's argument here is that there wouldn't be the proliferation of these ROMs on these various sites if there wasn't a place to play them. And Yuzu made that place available. And so they helped contribute to users doing the infringing by having this potentially non-infringing emulator exist in the first place. Now, this is a paragraph that's a little bit closer to Nintendo saying emulation itself is illegal because it foments piracy. They're not wrong in some of the precedents that we can look at from the Library of Congress even. We'll take a look at that in just a moment. But they are wrong on the notion that all emulation is illegal, right? Nintendo doesn't like emulation. They don't like the Connectix case precedent. They don't like some of the stuff that is developed on that front. Uh, and so they're using the DMCA to cover for it. But they are right to suggest that piracy hurts their business. And so they're trying to find a way to fight it. And this is the way that they've selected. Nintendo has invested enormous resources into protecting the Nintendo Switch console and its games through technological measures to ensure that Nintendo's games are purchased lawfully and not illegally copied, are not leaked before publication, and that the integrity of Nintendo's ecosystem remains safe and free of piracy and cheating. This protects the tremendous creative investment of Nintendo and its employees and hundreds of its third-party licensees. Today, Yuzu provides any internet user in the world with the means to unlawfully decrypt and play virtually any Nintendo Switch game without ever paying a dime for a Nintendo console or for that game. Almost sounds like an ad for Yuzu here, right? And to be clear, there's no lawful way to use Yuzu to play Nintendo Switch games, including because it must decrypt the game's encryption. Defendant must be held accountable for willfully providing users the means to violate Nintendo's intellectual property rights at such a scale. The harm to Nintendo is manifest and irreparable nature of the action parties are still nintendo and tropic haze and then we get into the factual background but before we do that let's take a look at some of what has been discussed by them already they're a little bit upset that yuzu is making money on this and we can see from the yuzu patreon that they are making thirty thousand dollars a month right now for the record the whole Glaw youtube channel patreon does not make anywhere near that money money but if you'd like to support the channel in conversations like that this one Please do check out player Patreon memberships here, super chats, likes, subscribes. Got to do the YouTube thing from time to time, folks. If you're listening to it on a podcast, hit whatever rating button is put in front of you on Spotify or Apple or wherever else you might be listening to it. Leave a comment, do all those nice things. And a special thanks today to Karen Paulson for going through that Patreon, sponsoring this episode. I really appreciate everyone that helps support the channel uh, and Yuzu. They've got that $30,000 Patreon. Nintendo doesn't like that. But it's important to note, as we look at some of that earlier precedent and other precedent on fair use factors, that that doesn't necessarily make Yuzu a loser in these cases, right? This is from the Bleem case. 
The fair use doctrine permits and requires courts to avoid rigid application of the copyright statute when, on occasion, it would stifle the very creativity which that law is designed to foster. The process of applying the fair use factors to the facts of any particular scenario calls for case-by-case -case analysis, and the task is not to be simplified with bright line rules. The four factors are to be considered together in light of the purposes of copyright, not in isolation. In this analysis, the commercial use of copyrighted material is not presumptively unfair. Rather, commercial use is but one of the four factors that we must weigh. The Supreme Court expressly rejected the irre irrebuttability of the presumption against fair use in commercial contexts in that case when the court flatly reversed the Sixth Circuit for making just a presumption. The court emphasized that although the fourth factor may be the most important, they put that commercial use as that fourth factor in that discussion, all factors must be considered and the commercial nature of the copies is just one element in the broader calculus. So Nintendo brings up this point to show damages, to show that they're making money on the, this company damaging them, but that isn't the end of the story when we're talking about what is or is not fair use, right? It's all to be balanced. It's all this kind of mire that you get stuck in as to what is going to be deemed by, to be fair use by a court at the end of the day, but it's not over just because you sell something. That's one of those things that I want to express pretty completely because the internet gets confused on this point. It says, well, if you're selling something, you're in trouble. And if you're not selling something, you're definitely not in trouble. And neither of those things is true. Neither of those things gets you fair use. Uh, you don't get fair use just because you're charitable. You don't lose fair use just because you're making money but they can be used against you essentially like that Miranda warning if you're ever arrested, right? So you have to know these things. You generally have to get advice of counsel if you're going to pursue something that is on the line here, but it's not definitive one way or the other. And before we get back into the lawsuit, I did see that there were some super chats I want to make sure I don't miss. We'll see if I can grab them and not get too confused into my place here. So here's David Hollinger, who you will see a little bit later on in this video. What does this mean for the long-term viability of common decryption libraries that read keys to decrypt something? What are the external consequences? Well, I think you're asking what are the external consequences to a win if Nintendo were to get it on this particular argument? Uh, and the answer to that is I can't specifically say. Certainly one of the things that Yuzu is likely to bring up in its defense is that taking Nintendo's arguments to the extreme might create problems for all sorts of parts of the digital infrastructure. And that might be one of the things that the court finds to be persuasive. But the answer to your question is complicated. And I think for the most part, a court would be trying to make the determination here on as narrow a applicability as possible, right? One of the things we're going to see, we're going to show in this video is that video games and video game consoles are treated differently at basically every level than general computer uh, services and general computing devices. And so I suspect that's one thing that will come out of this if it went to a full decision at the court level, which I don't anticipate because most of these things don't, is that uh, they would try to differentiate video game consoles and whatever precedent they set in their decision from the broader commercial computer ecosystem. But thank you for the question, David Hollinger. And like I said, you are going to pop up again later in this video, uh, including right now. Another question, could this lead to anyone suing anyone else for using keys to decrypt something that is determined to be the property of someone else? I will say what I say a lot in virtual legality, which is anybody can sue anyone for anything. Somebody could sue me right now because they feel led astray by what I'm telling them in the first 10 minutes. I would prefer that they don't. And that's why I highlight the question is ultimately whether you can get it kicked out of court very quickly because otherwise you start racking up costs and settlement looks more and more attractive to you. But anyone can sue anyone for anything. So depending on how this looks and how this Nintendo case gets settled or settled in court, uh, you could have something that is precedent that someone else could use, but we don't know exactly what the facts of that would be. So when you see lawyers say we don't answer hypothetical questions, that's part of the reason is because it's unclear exactly how that will be perceived without the specifics that would come with it. But I think you could see a Nintendo successful case here, bring about other lawsuits of a similar stripe, and that might start grabbing things that are in the general computing area, which is a legitimate concern. And I suspect one that Tropic Haze is likely to bring up. Chrono Rig, thank you for the super chat. Thank you for making videos like that. I love having these conversations. I hope they are helpful. And if you like this stuff, like it, subscribe, share it around. I like to have these conversations and hopefully we're adding more and better information to the world with a community that can get their questions answered and hopefully get that more and better information spread even further than just this channel. So thank you so much, Chrono Rig.
David Hollinger, thank you again for the super chat. Another question, if turning something into a possible tool for illegal activity qualifies a violation, then what are the legal implications broadly? I think the concern, and I think this is reflected in some of your other questions, David, is that Nintendo's argument here could be more uh, broadly applicable to general computing. And I think that is a worry, right? If you've, if, you, if you've got possible tool and this infringes at that level, then you can apply it in other places to the open source movement and things like that. But I don't think we can answer that question before we would have a court decision in front of us, and especially one that's been fully through appeals. And so I think you are justified in your concern about some of this broadness, uh, but I don't know that I can answer that question for you right now. Sorry about that. And one last super chat from David Hollinger. Yet another question. The very thing Yuzu is doing is done commonly in info security to identify and share hacks for vulnerabilities. This could cause wider reaching problems beyond games. Will the court consider that? I mean, the court will consider the arguments raised by both parties, right? So the question is, will Yuzu raise that kind of thing? And yes, I suspect whatever we get from a response from the Yuzu side of things will include, if you take their argument to their natural conclusion, here are the problems that you raise. This is not anticipated by Congress. This is not the meaning that the DMCA is supposed to have. Those various arguments are likely to be brought by them. It's one of the reasons I would caution everybody to say, this is just Nintendo's version of the world. And when I'm going to get done with this video and say, they plead something that is likely to survive summary dismissal, and that means that this is a potential problem for Yuzu. That doesn't mean that I think it's a winner. That just means that I think that they can get past the preliminary stages, and that creates a problem for a defendant in any case where you're dealing with a lot of money on the table. David Hollinger, sorry for all the questions. Please don't apologize for questions. That is why I am here. That is why I make these videos. While the law likes to separate games and software, they are technically the same thing. Thanks for the videos. I agree. One of the things I'm going to highlight is it's a little bit interesting how they parse them separately. And it's where people get confused on the internet when they think, well, I mean, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is essentially the same as Word. It's just one allows you to run around a 3D environment and the other makes you write documents for your legal clients. Uh, and, and at a broad basis, that's just ones and zeros in the same manner. That's not how the law views things. And primarily that's because in the intellectual property sphere, the law cares a lot more about protecting creative endeavors than it does protecting essentially what we might consider enterprise or serious business software, right? And that's the same in movies and other things like that. The law is a little bit more concerned about protecting things that are, are written and fictional and created in the minds of various people than it is in protecting news or documentary videos. And that is something reasonable minds can differ on and that people can say, well, maybe that's not the way the Copyright Act should be. But I'm just telling you how it is it right now. And I certainly do appreciate all the questions and the super chat and the support of the channel. And you are going to come up because I really liked a lot of the questions that you asked in the last couple of days to me. And I think they are useful jumping off points for some other things in this video. So thank you so much, David Hollinger. And thank you, everybody that helps support the channel uh, with super chats or otherwise. Just being here, being in the comments, interacting with this stuff helps YouTube know that this is stuff that you're interested in, that this is stuff that people should be seeing. And I really appreciate every bit of that. So with that said, let's see if we can bop back into this lawsuit and discuss it a little bit more. So the factual background is Nintendo makes video games. You might be familiar with them, Judge. Super Mario Brothers, Donkey Kong, Legend of Zelda. We think we're kind of a big deal and they're not wrong. Uh, we make various other things like Tetris, Kirby's Dreamland, and Pokemon. Nintendo has built his company through substantial creative and financial investment. Because of the lasting popularity of Nintendo's cherished games across all its prior consoles, Nintendo sometimes makes copyrighted games that initially developed for legacy consoles available for play on newer consoles. Now, understand, this kind of notion is establishing that there is, in fact, a market for these things crossing console lines, but also them deciding whether or not to enter into other markets is supposed to be their purview, right? They are supposed to have the exclusive rights to decide when, if ever, a Legend of Zelda game appears on the Steam Deck or the PC platform generally, uh, and Yuzu is taking that right away from them. That's part of this logical argument that Nintendo is making. The popularity of Nintendo's video games and video game consoles has made Nintendo the target of intellectual property pirates who benefit from Nintendo's innovation and investment by making unauthorized copies of Nintendo's video games or by creating unlawful devices and software such as the Yuzu emulator that allow others to play pirated copies of Nintendo's video games, right? Which is Nintendo saying, okay, maybe Yuzu can make some kind of claim that Yuzu itself should be okay but the fact of the matter is, on the ground, the real politic here, your honor, is that these things are used to pirate our games. These things hurt us through that piracy. And even if we're stretching the DMCA in little bits and pieces here, which we've talked about already, 
this should still be something that we're entitled to remedy from because Yuzu knows what it's doing. Yuzu knows how it is used. And that's the rest of this lawsuit is going to be, look at these emails we found from the creators of Yuzu saying, we know that most users are going to pirate some of these various things, et cetera, et cetera. Then it talks about the technological measures it implemented. We've got a lot of encryption on our Switch. The top five Nintendo developed games released for the Nintendo Switch alone have sold more than 198 million copies as of February 2024. Good Lord, Nintendo. And individually, each title has sold over 25 million copies. They are an incredible video game developer. The Nintendo Switch and Nintendo Switch games contain numerous technological measures designed to prevent unauthorized access. Remember, one of the things that's going to be tested is whether or not they have technological measures in place that control effectively access to their products and whether or not what Yuzu is doing is something that circumvents that technological measure. So that's why you see all this language kind of repeated. We encrypt stuff, we decrypt stuff, we do it at runtime, we do it in various places, at the game level, at the console level. We've got our stuff in place and they're going around it. So regardless of whether Yuzu as it exists is allowed, they had to go around these things to get it happening. And that in and of itself is illegal, Your Honor, and it hurts us and please make us right. First, each Nintendo eShop game is accompanied by an encrypted identifier or signature. A signature is a way for the author of a digital file to prove that a particular file of the file is authentic, a particular instance of the file. Here, an authentic Nintendo Switch console uses a cryptographic key to verify that Nintendo, in fact, signed the game file using a secret key. Second, each game is encrypted, etc., etc. Describes exactly what encryption it is. This would be useful later on in the case if someone were to argue that what they're using is not effective and it was known to not be effective. Um, so Nintendo is saying, no, we use real encryption. It's effective for controlling access. Putting this all together, when a user of a Nintendo Switch console goes to play an authentic game, the Switch must decrypt the game encryption by extracting the specific cryptographic key, decrypting the title key with the console's proprietary keys from the prod keys, and then using the now dec decrypted title key to decrypt the audio-visual content of the game. In the case of a Nintendo eShop game, the Nintendo Switch must ad additionally first verify the game signature prior to decrypting the game encryption. In fact, I found that when I was traveling uh, recently because my Switch would not allow me to play on the plane because it kept saying that it was trying to call home to make sure that I was allowed to play it, and it kept finding that I couldn't because I didn't have Wi-Fi access on that plane trip, which is really annoying for me, but certainly part of what Nintendo is describing here. Third, each authentic Nintendo Switch console also contains many technological measures, such as encrypted system signatures, that are checked when the console boots. Much like the measures protecting the games, only if the console's signature verifications confirm the console is authentic and authorized by Nintendo, will the Nintendo Switch start up normally. So again, this is all a list of reasons why we are trying to protect our copyrighted material, and in order to get into it, you had to circumvent the technological measures we put in, all because of that DMCA, right? Yuzu Overview. Yuzu is a video game emulator for Nintendo Switch games. A video game emulator is a piece of software that we saw described uh, that allows general purpose computing devices to play video games published only for a specific console. Note that this is a little bit eased back from what they put in the intro sections of this lawsuit that it was illegal. The defendant makes two versions of Yuzu available for download from a standalone website, yuzu-emu.org, which pulls the software from a GitHub server. These versions are compatible with Windows and Linux systems, including PCs. Although Yuzu can be downloaded for free, defendant maintains the Patreon page for the Yuzu team, which solicits monthly donations for the project in exchange for early access to daily updates and special unreleased features. Similarly, on Google Play, Defendant offers a paid early access version and a free version for Android devices, both of which were recently released. Yuzu's Patreon account currently has over 7,000 patrons, and according to the Yuzu Patreon page, earns Defendant and its developers approximately $30,000 a month. Since the publication of the Android version of Yuzu on Google Play on May 30th, 2023, the free version has been downloaded over a million times, and the paid version has been downloaded over 10,000 times, earning defendant at least an additional $50,000 plus. Now we know for a fact that to the extent it goes to the Google Play Store, that a big chunk of that, 30%, goes to Google, uh, but Nintendo doesn't have to make that leap for themselves as part of this particular assertion uh, in the lawsuit. So they say, hey, you made a lot of money on that, uh, and we think that that's wrong. Yuzu only allows for the play of video games published for the Nintendo Switch. Yuzu is not compatible with games made for any other console, including games actually designed for Windows, Linux, or Android systems. After downloading and installing Yuzu, the user is able to use Yuzu and its circumvention functionality to play pirated games using their associated keys. All the user needs to do is supply an unlawfully obtained copy of the prod keys, cryptographic keys, the defendant has given them the tools to find an encrypted Nintendo Switch game ROM. As discussed in more detail below, 
Yuzu's website provides detailed instructions on how to unlawfully acquire the requisite cryptographic keys and unauthorized and encrypted copies of Nintendo Switch games for Yuzu to run. But all of that is only to make Yuzu function as intended. But for Yuzu, a user could have keys and they could have encrypted ROMs, but they couldn't play games. This is what we call but for causation in the law, right? If they didn't exist, this wouldn't be a problem. Now, that's a little bit broad because we would assume that another competitor would exist that would figure this out. But hey, Nintendo is trying to make a case here. The defendant instructs users how to circumvent their Nintendo Switch consoles and make unlawful copies of encrypted games so users can circumvent and play those games. And here's where we get into a little bit of trouble with that earlier section that I pointed out, 117, which says, hey, you can dump computer programs. Uh, and Nintendo is going to ignore that for purposes of this particular argument. Yuzu's website provides a quick start guide with step-by-step -step instructions and links to set up Yuzu by using unlawful methods to hack one's own Nintendo Switch and create unauthorized copies of Nintendo Switch games. As discussed below, Yuzu's lead developer, Bunny, has also acknowledged the quick start guide can be confusing, and users probably just pirate a Yuzu folder with everything. All right, so they're establishing here with some evidence that Yuzu knows, quote unquote, knows for legal purpose that what users are likely to do is look at this big long list of instructions and say, okay, but we're just grabbing things that other people have grabbed otherwise, right? There should be a place where I can find these things online. And those are technically pirated copies, even if you own the underlying physical one, because you didn't make that archival copy yourself. And so Nintendo says we are harmed in this particular way because you can just go grab whatever you want wherever you want on the internet once it exists and is distributed, and Yuzu made that all possible and, in fact, told people how to do it, right? So is that a problem fundamentally? That's a good question under the DMCA because they're just sharing information and directions to these various tools. Is that trafficking in a portion of a service? I don't know. That's a close question. I suspect that Yuzu probably has the stronger argument there, but it's not an argument that I can just dismiss summarily at the opening levels. When you are looking at that, dis that summary dismissal portion of a case, what the court is supposed to do is take a pleading by someone like Nintendo here and say, if we assume all of it's true and we read everything with the benefit of the doubt to the pleading party, Nintendo, is that something that the court should find a remedy for? Is it something that is illegal under the statutes that have been presented to us? And I think giving the benefit of the doubt to Nintendo at that level you do say Nintendo has maybe a case here, and so I can't kick it out of court. We have to go through the whole process of a legal trial, and then Yuzu has to start reevaluating its settlement positions. Hacking a Nintendo Switch requires circumventing the many console technological measures, the console measures, and installing an unauthorized operating system onto that Nintendo Switch. Certain devices and software that perform this unlawful task were the subject of three recent civil lawsuits brought by Nintendo, as well as a criminal indictment prosecuted by the U.S. Department of Justice, all of which resulted in judgments providing that these devices and software are unlawful under the DMCA, which is fine, right? But note that Yuzu isn't the one making these things or otherwise providing them to users. And in fact, they aren't even the ones using them. It's those users that want to get access to Yuzu and do these various things that are performing that function. So Nintendo's argument here is that Yuzu is contributing to others' infringement by telling them how to do it and providing them this benefit for having done it rather than doing it themselves. And so that's where the novel legal argument comes in. That's where it's another step forward for fighting against emulation using the DMCA. And that's where a lot of people, when you read these various articles, whether it's on The Verge or Ars Technica or somewhere else, are saying that this maybe is going too far for Nintendo. And I, I tend to think that this is a broadening of what we've got on precedent on these particular topics, but th that it isn't a crazy one. So it wouldn't surprise me if this does settle. Yuzu's Quick Start Guide on Information and Belief, drafted by or on the direction of Bunny, recommends other unlawful devices and software that accomplish similar functions as those at issue in the lawsuits, and the guide sets forth their operation in great detail. For example, the guide links to, among others, Tegra RCM GUI, a piece of software that puts a Nintendo Switch console into a hidden recovery mode so the user can execute custom code on the console, Hecate, a bootloader that loads and boots unauthorized custom firmware onto the Nintendo Switch, etc., 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 Use of the lockpick tool is a particularly important step if a user is following the quick start guide. Lockpick extracts the prod keys from a Nintendo Switch console, the set of cryptographic keys that Yuzu needs to decrypt video game ROMs during its operation. If a user follows defendant's instructions and utilizes the unlawful software modules that Yuzu website links to, i.e. if the user unlawfully circumvents the console measures on a Nintendo Switch and obtains the prod keys using lockpick, that user will be able to dump an encrypted game ROM of a Nintendo Switch game onto a memory card and decrypt and play that dumped game with Yuzu, which all leads us back to where we were looking at in the articles, which is, 
okay, so the difference here is that Yuzu doesn't bring that stuff to the party. It just tells people how to get it. But what does that mean for the DMCA? And Nintendo says it means it's illegal. Yuzu is undoubtedly going to say it does not mean that, but it's at least a plausible reading of the DMCA. This may seem complicated, says Nintendo, but, but in private, Bunny admits that it is a far easier way. When a user raised in a, in a Discord chat operated by defendant that setting up Yuzu was complicated, Bunny first said, unfortunately, at this time, it's not as simple as running a simple script and that there are several specific manual steps, hence why to go through the whole process, you need to basically learn what they are. Or, Bunny added, users probably just pirate a Yuzu folder with everything. It's worth noting here that Nintendo does appear to be in the Yuzu Discord server hearing these conversations. So it's worth noting uh, that Nintendo is around looking at these various things uh, on the regular basis. But yes, if you have what is believed to be the lead developer of the emulator saying, hey, look, the real politic here is that people probably just go pirate what they're looking for. We have to put these instructions because our lawyers say that we have to. Uh, but we know that people are going to go around these things because they're just going to be out there in distribution forums. And so that's what's going to happen. Indeed, on information and belief, most users of Yuzu do not go through the Quick Start Guide and do not circumvent their own Nintendo Switch to obtain the prod keys they need, nor do they dump their own games, though both of them both are themselves unlawful. And that's maybe a bridge too far. If we don't know. That hasn't really fully been tested in court either, uh, but Nintendo can make that assertion here because it's not key to their case. Rather, most obtain the prod keys and illegal copies of games online. Indeed, libraries of pirated Nintendo Switch ROMs are unfortunately available online. Websites such as nsw2u.com collect direct download links for thousands of Nintendo Switch titles and notes that the ROMs are compatible with Yuzu. Other sites will even package a pirated game ROM with a copy of Yuzu so that a user can download everything they need to pirate and play the game with one click. Very convenient from the piracy websites, but not too terribly useful to Nintendo. To play a Nintendo Switch game in Yuzu, Yuzu unlawfully decrypts Nintendo's game encryption. That's how the actual software Yuzu operates, right? As it pretends to be a Switch and decrypts it on the fly. Importantly, an unauthorized Nintendo video game ROM is still an encrypted game file protected by the game encryption, right? So if we look at Yuzu and we don't find that they've got a problem with the various other things that are happening, we can still get them, Your Honor, because Yuzu itself is decrypting on the fly. It's pretending to be a Switch. So that is circumventing the technological measure that is built into the game ROM. So we've got you on the on the console side, right? But maybe you don't believe us on that argument. Okay, well then next, they have to bring an encrypted ROM to the party. That's fine. Maybe you haven't found them to be in violation yet, but the way this thing actually operates is to circumvent technological measures on the fly. And so that, Your Honor, has to be a violation of the law. And I think this is a stronger argument, to be frank. Indeed, defendant's lead developer admits as much. When asked in a June 2018 Discord chat whether XCIS, the file type of game ROM dumps from a cartridge, comes decrypted, Bunny responded, they are encrypted. Nintendo is not aware of any source of decrypted Nintendo Switch game ROMs. Yuzu allows users to play unauthorized copies of Nintendo Switch games by circumventing the game encryption at or immediately before runtime. Recall that in an authentic Nintendo Switch, the prod keys are a set of cryptographic keys that perform a number of functions, including assisting decrypting games. An authentic Nintendo Switch's extracts a game's encrypted title key and decrypts it using keys in the prod keys, and then dynamically decrypts the game ROM during runtime using the title key and another key from the prod keys. So said another way, Nintendo's argument here is the way the Switch actually functions to even play a game means that to emulate the Nintendo Switch is illegal because you have to decrypt on the fly and so we built this thing to be illegal on its face to emulate. And that might be, again, where you get that Ars Technica headline and the lawyer statements that says Nintendo's fighting emulation on the whole. And while I think that is too broad, I do think that what they do mean is that Nintendo is fighting emulation of the systems as they are developed today in 2024, or more specifically for the Switch 2017, is illegal because the way we have built these things is to have technological protection measures at every step, both in the console itself to get at what the console does and then to do what the console does when you're trying to play a game on it. So Nintendo has, I think, a better argument than some people online are giving them credit for because they engineered this system to be something that requires illegal activity to emulate successfully after the fact. Now, will they win this argument? I don't know, but I can't dismiss it out of hand, and that's more important for Nintendo at this point in time. User performs the same functions when a user attempts to play an unauthorized Nintendo Switch game on ROM. They're doing what Nintendo is doing. They're decrypting, and that's circumventing the, the technology measure. Yuzu also allows users to dump a ROM FS directory, which is a game's decrypted file system, and which includes the game's audiovisual assets. As described on yuzu-emu.org, this includes the game's textures, text, fonts, sounds, or other graphical assets. 
Although it is not possible to play the game solely from this directory, users can use the outputted copies of the game's audiovisual content to modify the content and thus alter gameplay in Yuzu the next time the game is run. On information and belief, this feature is how many pirates access and distribute game assets from pre-release games, as described in more detail below. Yuzu's access and copying of any Nintendo game's audiovisual assets is without Nintendo's authorization and would not be possible without Yuzu decrypting the game's uh, game encryption. Right, so this is saying something different from complete games. This is they can get stuff out of the games that shouldn't be available to them. Period, because we've got all these technological measures in place. Yuzu is used for widespread piracy. Any copy of a Nintendo Switch game ROM not on an authorized cartridge or console is an unauthorized copy and therefore infringing. Copies played in Yuzu would otherwise have to be purchased if Nintendo offered its games on the PC platform. As the copyright owner of its creative games, Nintendo has the right to decide whether or when to enter the market of games for platforms other than its own console, both with, both with respect to its current and forthcoming games and with respect to any game in its legacy collection, right? Nintendo is saying, look, we're in the business of selling Switches. That's one of the places where we make money. If we wanted to bring Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom to the PC or the Steam Deck, we would do that to sell that game, uh, but we don't want to do that, and that's our right. That's what copyright means. And so Yuzu is taking that right from us just through the way it operates in the world. And that's something you need to be aware of, which isn't a specific statutory argument. It's essentially telling the court, this is how we're harmed. The court is going to be against piracy. That's one of the things we'll see throughout the statutes, the congressional readings of these various statutes. And we're going to take a look at that a little later on in the video. So Nintendo says piracy is bad. Even if Yuzu is okay, even if you look at all these things on a technical basis and say, these things are all right in compliance with the DMCA, you should understand that it's doing very bad things in the way that people are actually using them, that the maker of this product knows that they're doing very bad things, and so you should penalize them because of those very bad things. The harm to Nintendo caused by defendant and Yuzu goes far beyond users making unauthorized copies of games. On information and belief, the vast majority of Yuzu users are using Yuzu to play downloaded pirated games. On information and belief, Yuzu develops similarly test Yuzu developers similarly test and play downloaded pirated games in Yuzu, including notably pre-released copies without which the developers would not be able to get Nintendo Switch games running in Yuzu so quickly after release. This piracy causes Nintendo tremendous harm, including millions of dollars of monetary harm from lost video game sales, both of Nintendo's and its licensees' copyrighted games and loss of goodwill. Indeed, there is a robust community of intellectual property thieves who distribute pirated Nintendo Switch ROMs for the broad community who play those ROMs in Yuzu. For instance, on Reddit, a social media platform, thank you for letting us know, until June 2023, there was a Yuzu Pirates subreddit which provided advice to would-be pirates and links to on online ROM repositories where users could download pirated games for play in Yuzu. Happy pirating, read the subreddit description. The subreddit alone had over 70,000 members, and non-members could see the advice in ROM repository links, so the number of people who accessed those links likely dwarfed the number of members. In June 2023, Reddit banned the subreddit as violating its content policy. And again, this is useful for Nintendo establishing that Yuzu is used for very bad things. It's not as useful from a full legal perspective because Yuzu isn't responsible for all these various things, right? That's one of the things we've talked about in virtual legality, which is to say, when you're talking about Little Big Planet or Dreams or something else that provides tools for creation, if the people that use those tools to infringe on intellectual property do that, that doesn't mean that Dreams is illegal. It doesn't mean that Little Big Planet is illegal. It does mean that those platforms might have the obligation to try to police some of those uses, but it doesn't make the actual tools themselves illegal. And that's one of the things Nintendo is probably going to get back from Yuzu in whatever their response document winds up looking like. One of the links provided on the subreddit went to a GitHub page with simplified instructions for installing Yuzu, and those instructions are still online. The instructions do not include any of the complex steps for hacking a Nintendo Switch console and dumping one's own games. Instead, the alternative instructions merely provide links where users can download the requisite keys and pirated games for use in Yuzu. As another example recently, Nintendo published the already acclaimed Nintendo Switch title Tears of the Kingdom and made it available for play on May 12, 2023. However, full copies of the game ROM began to be circulated online on May 1, 2023. Because Tears of the Kingdom had yet to be released to the public, every copy in circulation was undoubtedly a pirated copy and every user who possessed a copy had not lawfully purchased the game. I think Nintendo is probably right here, but it isn't undoubtedly the case that it's a pirated copy. It could be a leaked copy. It could be a warehouse stolen copy. You don't really know on these kinds of things. Nintendo tracks the availability of pirated copies of its games online. Between May 1st and May 10th, Tears of the Kingdom was successfully downloaded over 1 million times, and downloads were attempted another million times. 
The illegal downloaded copies were capable of being played in Yuzu, and over 20% of all the download links for the game specifically referred to emulation in the link title, URL, or file name, many of which were specifically referred to Yuzu. Notably, between May 1st and May 12th, membership on the Yuzu Patreon, which provides paid members more updated early access builds of Yuzu, doubled. Right, so Nintendo's trying to make the, the case here that not only does Yuzu know that people are doing this, Yuzu directly monetarily benefits from people doing this, and so is going to be incentivized to either keep that up or to not police it properly. On information and belief, thousands of additional paid members of Yuzu's Patreon signed up so that they could download the early access build and play unlawful copies of Tears of the Kingdom. On information and belief, defendant and its agents were fully aware of the reason membership of the Patreon exploded. Uh, in that Yuzu was being used for unlawful pay, play of pirated copies of Tears of the Kingdom. Indeed, Bunny implemented a ban on discussing Tears of the Kingdom emulation in Yuzu's Discord server because so many Yuzu users were trying to seek support emulating it. Additionally, because Yuzu is open source, many individuals quickly developed and released Yuzu mods that were capable of playing Tears of the Kingdom. Defendant and its agents were aware of these efforts too, and Bunny said as much in an interview Bunny gave to PC Gamer on the day of Tears of the Kingdom's release, explicitly referring to the gaming community releasing custom Yuzu emulator builds to play Tears of the Kingdom days ahead of its release. Two images of Tears of the Kingdom running in Yuzu's game prior to the release date are shown here. The prevalence of piracy of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom in the days leading up to its release, in large part through emulators such as Yuzu, harmed law-abiding Nintendo customers too. For example, many fans of The Legend of Zelda were forced to avoid social media to prevent seeing spoilers and preserve their surprise and delight for the actual game release, as seen as these fan posts. Here's one from Stealth, who is somebody I follow on Twitter. I recommend it. It's a good... Good Twitter follow, really likes Nintendo and, and JRPG uh, content. Tears of the Kingdom leaked, so there are new screenshots floating around. I've waited four plus years for the game. We are so close to release. I'm trying so hard not to see anything. It's a shame that this regularly happens for big games. I actually remember that tweet going out. Now, I will say, as a legal claim of its own, I'm not sure there's a great claim to damages of customers not being able to watch social media quite as prevalently on the day of release of a game like this or even the days before it. I don't view that as a, a high level of damages for these individuals and certainly not one that Nintendo can bring on their behalf. But again, what Nintendo's trying to do in this part of the lawsuit is establish that Yuzu is resulting in very bad things, right? It's hurting our brand recognition. It's hurting how people feel about our system and our games. And I don't think it's the strongest case here. And so far as people are so excited about this game that they're giving Yuzu money and they're, they're trying to get access to it early. Uh, and I don't think Stealth was particularly harmed by this, although it would be better if these things weren't out there for someone that wants to be on social media. But again, just trying to establish that Yuzu is causing all these problems for them. Yuzu also has a feature called Telemetry, which according to Yuzu's website, collects anonymous data about its users' use of the software. This data, again, according to Yuzu, includes what games users are playing, so user developers can de discover what are the most popular games and hardware configurations where emulated games crash in Yuzu most often and more. On information and belief, Plaintiff expects discovery to show that this data reveals to defendant and its developers that its users are playing pirated copies of games, including because the data reflects people playing games prior to their official release date. They knew that it was doing this for pirated copies. And again, that's important for 1201, because if we look at 1201, when we talk about when you're in trouble for trafficking, it's marketed by a person or another acting in concert with that person, with that person's knowledge that it's being used to circumvent a technological measure, right? And so that it's being used for piracy is a part of this kind of conversation about what is being trafficked, even though that circumvention may or may not be something that Nintendo is able to fully win on. So that'll be interesting to follow. Yuzu's lead developer, Bunny, has been at the center of Nintendo's console emulation for years. Bunny says that they pro provided minor contributions to an open source Nintendo GameCube emulator called Dollwin in the early 2000s before writing their own Nintendo GameCube emulator called Gecko, in 2005. Bunny was then the lead developer for Citra, a Nintendo 3DS emulator, which is still widely available and still supported. In January 2018, less than a year after the launch of the Nintendo Switch, and given by their gravitation to the latest and greatest thing, for better or worse, Bunny announced the forthcoming creation of the Yuzu emulator. By April 2018, Yuzu could play a handful of the Nintendo Switch's more primitive games, and steady modifications since then have allowed Yuzu to play the vast majority of current Nintendo Switch games. Indeed, Yuzu's website provides a game compatibility list which identifies over 2,500 different games that Yuzu developers, including Bunny, have tested and played in Yuzu, over 1,800 of which are playable from start to finish. However, the number of compatible games is likely significantly higher, as the available list is outdated by two years. Bunny describes himself as Yuzu's author and project lead. In interviews, 
Bunny has stated that they did most of the work to initially st stand up the project and get Nintendo Switch games loading, as well as most of the work to get early graphics rendering working and the initial implementation of the audio backend. Bunny states that they have a lot of breadth in their knowledge of the entire system. Yuzu's code history bears this out. As Yuzu is open source, records reflecting users' contributions to the software are public. GitHub's records indicate that Bunny has added and revised more lines of Yuzu code than any other user. As project lead, Bunny has acknowledged of and directs the conduct of each of the several other developers who contribute to Yuzu. For instance, Yuzu's website has a blog that includes at least monthly updates on the status of development of the emulator, including what each developer has worked on that month and what improvements have been made to the emulation of specific games. Bunny is regularly featured in the monthly updates. The developers also communicate in the Yuzu Discord chat, as we know Nintendo knows because they've referenced what happens in that Discord chat a number of times, and Bunny has publicly asked specific developers to work on specific tasks for the project. Bunny has made blatantly clear that a central goal of theirs is to get recently released and in-demand titles playing unlawfully in Yuzu. I'm betting that Bunny hasn't made it blatantly clear that he wants them playing unlawfully, but we do get what Nintendo is saying here. So again, Nintendo is viewing that this entire endeavor is unlawful. One suspects that the Yuzu creators are thinking that this is lawful if they use the quick start guide and various other things that are happening there. It certainly appears to be a project that has gone through at least one legal pass of trying to be in compliance with certain presidents. Nintendo is trying to say, no, that's still not in compliance, but one does feel for creators of emulators like Yuzu. Consistent with that drive, Bunny regularly works to get new Nintendo Switch games running in Yuzu on the day of their release. In addition to Tears of the Kingdom discussed above, Yuzu and Bunny specifically have announced their major Nintendo titles such as Metroid Dread, Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury, and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu were playable in Yuzu on their day of release, as for instance seen in Bunny's post on November 16th, 2018. So Yuzu, very bad, doing very bad things. Now, how? why are we suing them? Well, as we expected from the start of this video, Trafficking and Circumvention Technology in Violation of 17 U.S.C. 1201-A2. So A2 is, is right where we were talking about. This is 1201-A1 is circumvention itself. And then A2 is trafficking. No person shall manufacture, import, offer to the public, provide, or otherwise traffic in any technology, product, service, device, component, or part thereof that is primarily designed to circumvent a technological measure, has only limited commercial significance, purpose or use other than circumvention of a technological measure or it's important it's an or not an and right any of these categories you fall in you're in trouble is marketed by that person or another acting on their behalf with that person's knowledge for use in circumventing a technological measure and so Yuzu certainly appears to be circumventing technological measures from my perspective as pled by nintendo and again i do yield to people with better technological understanding than i on these things but as nintendo describes it it does appear to be circumventing a technological measure, but note that Nintendo doesn't start with that circumvention. It starts with the trafficking. Why? Because the circumvention itself is subject to exceptions. And part of what they're trying to avoid here is that Yuzu can go and say, exception A applies, the Library of Congress is looking at these various things, and this should be allowed. Trafficking is separate from that exception. In fact, if we go back and look at 1201 for just a second, we see that there's a provision that says, Neither the exception under paragraph, subparagraph B from the applic applicability of the prohibition contained in subparagraph A, go lawyers, nor any determination made in a rulemaking conducted under subparagraph C, that's the Library of Congress, may be used as a defense in any action to enforce any provision of this title other than this one, other than the circumvention direct. So trafficking is designed to be specifically separate from that whole Library of Congress process. And that's important when we look at that a little bit more. So they say trafficking is a problem. Section 1201A2 prohibits, in a general sense, the trafficking in technology primarily designed to circumvent technological measures that effectively control access to copyrighted works. The statute provides, as we just read, and then the technological measures effectively control access to works protected by the Copyright Act, including Nintendo Switch video games in which Nintendo owns or exclusively controls copyrights. Also discussed above, the technological measures, including the game encryption, require in the ordinary course of their operation, the application of information or a process or a treatment with Nintendo's authority to gain access to Nintendo Switch video games, which we recognize is the language that is required to establish what a technological measure is to effectively control access to a work, right? If the measure in the ordinary course of its operation requires the application of information or process or treatment with the authority of a copyright owner to gain access to the work. So we see Nintendo pleading exactly as the statute is written. This is what good lawyers do. They look at the statute, they say what is required, and we plead exactly what is needed there. Hopefully because it lines up with what the actual facts are, but a good lawyer is gonna make this language work in any event, 
Yuzu, designed by defendant and its agents, circumvents the game encryption on Nintendo Switch video games, including by decrypting their many layers of encryption, thereby enabling access to and play of those games on unlicensed platforms. Yuzu's circumvention, as described herein, is thus both primarily designed to circumvent an effective technological measure and has only limited commercially significant purpose or use other than to circumvent that effective technological measure. And I know reasonable minds can differ on this, so please do leave me your comments or otherwise if you feel any specific way about how this is being pled right now. And I will be getting to those certainly at the end of the video. Defendant and its agents know that Yuzu is designed, implemented, and used to circumvent the game encryption and their conduct promoting Yuzu thus constitutes marketing with knowledge for Yuzu's use in circumventing an effective technological measure. By developing Yuzu, including paying developers and directing their conduct, defendant manufactures that technology in violation, and through use of their domains, defendant offers to the public, provides, and otherwise traffics in Yuzu in violation of A2, A, B, and or C. Manufacturing and each offering to the public provision or other act of trafficking in Yuzu constitutes, constitutes a violation of 1201, for which plaintiff is entitled to damages under 1203 and injunctive relief under another aspect of 1203. Additionally, on yuzu-emu.org, defendant offers to the public, provides and otherwise traffics in software that circumvents the console measures on Nintendo Switch consoles by providing direct links to such software on other websites. And this is, again, another kind of additional notion, right? It's not just information that they're sharing. They're sharing links to these various tools. And is that trafficking? Do you have to make it yourself? The answer to that is no, uh, as a lawyer reads this, because what is prohibited is manufacturer. That's making it yourself. Import, that's bringing it into the country yourself. Offering to the public is separate from making it. Providing is also separate, subject to making it. And trafficking in is going to be different than making it. So linking to it may or may not be its own violation. And certainly linking to it in the context of how to break through some of these technological measures is something that I think probably is a violation of this law. But I can't say that for certain because it isn't something that has been fully tested in court as of this point in time. It is, however, in my opinion, sufficient to get past that motion for summary dismissal that is going to come at the start of this case because it does seem like this is trafficking. This quick start guide with links and telling you exactly how to do it is trafficking in this technology designed to circumvent technological measures. And Nintendo has made a plausible case in this pleading that those technological measures were designed to pre prevent access to their copyrighted materials, whether that's at the console hardware level or the game level, and that Yuzu is deliberately circumventing those things or making circumvention possible. So that's where we're at with this. You then see another trafficking cause of action uh, under B1, which I didn't highlight because it's effectively the same provision. I don't know the legislative history here to establish exactly why this provision is effectively copied twice. There's a little bit of extra language in the second version, but B also says, no person shall manufacture, import, offer to the public, provide, or otherwise traffic in any technology, product, service, device, component, or part thereof. That, A, is primarily designed to produce for the purpose of circumventing protection afforded by a technological measure that effectively protects the right of a copyright owner under this title in a work or a portion thereof, which has some language changes, very small, uh, but effectively says the same thing. And the same other provisions are also in B. So when you bring an A2 claim, you also bring a B1 claim. And that is what Nintendo has done here. They say the same thing. Look, they're trafficking in this stuff, and that's a problem for us. And only after they have the two trafficking claims do they get to count three, which is that they're circumventing technological measures themselves, right? So trafficking, first and foremost, not subject to the exceptions of the Library of Congress. We'll talk about that a little bit more, I promise. I've said that a couple of times, but I do promise. And then count three is, hey, you're circumventing it yourself, right? Plaintiff repeats everything we said above, all that background that we gave you. And then we say, what is 12... 1201A1A do, in a general sense, it prohibits circumvention of a technological measure that effectively controls access to a work protected by the Copyright Act. The technological measures are each effective and control access to works protected by the Copyright Act, and Yuzu circumvents those measures. During development of Yuzu, defendants' agents, inclu including Bunny, at minimum, hacked at least one Nintendo Switch console, dumped games from a hacked Nintendo Switch console, and loaded those game copies into Yuzu and played them. Each of those steps requires circumvention of one or more of the technological measures. Now, as I've talked about with you, this last one about loading games, decrypting them on the fly, that might be the best argument Nintendo makes because that is fully circumventing a technological measure as it happens. The hacking one Nintendo Switch console and, and figuring out how it operates and then copying it seems to me to run into the same issue that Sony had arguing against Connectix, right? Even if you copy it, if it's an intermediate step in order to get something done that is not otherwise infringing, right? If the code isn't copied, but it does the same thing, 
uh, in this particular item, Yuzu, rather than the Switch, then that isn't infringement in and of itself, and Kinectic seems pretty strong on that particular point. But the actual decrypting of games in runtime on the fly is probably a better argument for Nintendo than ultimately making the emulator itself. So we'll see where that winds up at the end of the day, or we won't. We'll see it settled. But that's where I see these things happening. Nintendo's best claim is how Yuzu actually runs at the time. And a reasonable person could argue that any software provider could then make their system require that runtime decryption and then get out of all of the emulator precedents by use of the DMC 1201, and that's a problem. And I would say that they've made a good argument, except that the argument is not with the courts or those enforcing the laws or the lawyers telling you about them. It's with Congress to go fix up the DMCA and potentially have an exception made for co video game consoles that meet certain criteria that would allow this kind of thing. Each act of circumvention constitutes a violation of 1201, for which plaintiff is entitled to damages under 1203. Defendant and its agents are willful, intentional, purposeful, and in disregard of and indifferent to the rights of plaintiff. Defendant is liable for each of its agents' illegal acts as set forth herein. Now, this is important for Nintendo. This is actually a tough claim to bring because of all the reasons we've said in this video already, which is to say they want to say that they are bad actors. They're doing this deliberately and infringing deliberately because that allows Nintendo to ask the court to use its equitable powers, the powers that force somebody to do something rather than just move money around. Uh, and they are going to try to ask for access to the domains and to crush uh, Yuzu under their weighty boots. And they need to they need to establish that they are bad actors in order to do that. I think Yuzu has actually got a plausible claim that they are trying to follow the precedents that are set, like Connectix and various aspects of what has been shown in video games as of yet. And that if they are in violation of the law, that is not something they would have known in advance because that would be essentially decided in this case. And so it's a little bit hard for me to see them as willful, intentional, and purposeful infringers because I think this is a close question either way, even though I think Nintendo has pled a pretty good case here. As a direct and proximate result of defendants' violations of 1201, plaintiff is entitled to the maximum statutory damages, right? Because they're willful bad actors. And that may or may not be true, depending on how the court would find on this. In the alternative, under 1201c2, plaintiff is entitled to its actual damages, as well as to defendants' profits from these violations. It amounts to be proven at trial, which, based on what they've shown for Tears of the Kingdom alone, would be a substantial amount of money and a substantial enough amount of money that you can get the users of the world to come to the settlement table, one presumes. Plaintiff is entitled to its costs, including reasonable attorney's fees pursuant to 1203. Defendants and its agents conduct has caused, unless enjoined by this court, will continue to cause Nintendo great and irreparable injury for which there is no adequate remedy at law. And when you see this phrase, right, remedies at law, when we talk about legal remedies, that is code, legal code for moving money around where the court says damages are owed and, and somebody has to write a check to somebody else. Equitable remedies are forcing somebody to do something or refrain from doing something. Remedies at law are damages. They're moving money around. So this is Nintendo saying, look, even if we get a check from them, this wouldn't solve our issue because Yuzu is still out there. So we're entitled to permanent injunctive relief prohibiting defendant and its members from engaging in further acts of offering to the public, providing or otherwise trafficking in Yuzu or other circumvention software. Not only do we need their money, Your Honor, we need you to stop them from even distributing this thing. Unauthorized reproduction and distribution of protected works in violation of 17 USC 106.1. So if you remember from the top of this video, 106 is the baseline copyright rules. So they are reproducing things that are ours, Your Honor. Plaintiff repeats and realleges every allegation above. Section 106 of the Copyright Act provides in pertinent part that the owner of a copyright under the Copyright Act has the exclusive right to reproduce, distribute, publicly perform, and publicly display individual images of its audiovisual works. Plaintiff owns valid registered copyrights in numerous games for the Nintendo Switch. For instance, Nintendo holds copyrights in Tears of the Kingdom, Animal Crossing, Mario Kart 8, Xenoblade Chronicles, Paper Mario, and Metroid Dread. You do wonder exactly why they come up with this specific list rather than a different one, right? Upon information and belief, defendants' agents infringe these copyrights and plaintiff expects discovery to reveal that many more games have been infringed in which it holds valid registered copyrights. Nintendo has not licensed its rights to the defendant or otherwise provided authorization for defendant or its agents to exercise any of Nintendo's exclusive rights in its copyrighted games. Defendants' agents, such as Bunny, admit to dumping Nintendo games they have lawfully purchased and copying the game ROMs, into Yuzu. And again, that probably is legally okay. Computer programs are a little bit different than video games, and the law probably hasn't answered this question specifically, but this is probably something that is largely okay. On information and belief, Bunny dumped and copied each of the titles in paragraph 113 while acting within the scope of their authority from defendant. Each such reproduction constitutes a violation of 17 U.S.C. 501, 
So 501 is where you say what infringement is and its violations of 106, for which plaintiff is entitled to damages under 504 and 505 and injunctive relief under 502 and 503. On information and belief, defendant's agents, while acting within the scope of their authority from defendant, have also downloaded game ROMs online from pirate websites, which they have not lawfully been purchased. Each such reproduction constitutes a violation of 17 U.S.C. 501, that's your infringement provision, for which plaintiff is entitled to those damages we talked about. On information and belief, User developers have transmitted copies of game ROMs of Nintendo games to each other while acting within the scope of their authority from defendant. Each such distribution constitutes a violation of 17 U.S.C. 501 infringement for which plaintiff is entitled to damages. So they say, okay, you grab pirated copies, that's a problem. You grab those pirated copies and distribute it amongst your, yourselves, that's a problem. Because even when we talk about 117, that's just an exception for archival, not for moving around between people. And so that's an issue. You're fomenting piracy. This one where you dump it from legally owned is maybe a problem, maybe not, depending on exactly how archival purposes is viewed and moving something from a switch access point to a general computing device, PC access point. Uh, but Nintendo says all of these are issues for us. This isn't how we want our games to be moving around. Defendant and its agents are willful, intentional, purposeful, and in disregard of and indifferent to the rights of Nintendo. And again, I think that's probably the hardest part of their case because I do, it does look from the outside in that Yuzu is taking certain steps to try to avoid being specifically willfully infringers. Uh, and Nintendo needs to make that point in order to get some of the equitable provisions rather than just damages. As a direct and proximate result of defendant's violations, plaintiff is entitled to the maximum statutory damages in the amount of 150,000 with respect to each copyrighted work or such other amounts as may be proper under 504. In the alternative, plaintiff is entitled to its actual damages as well as to defendant's profits from these violations in amounts to be proven at trial. In alternative meaning, hey, if that's higher, we want the higher number. Plaintiff is entitled to its full costs, including reasonable attorney's fees pursuant to 505 and defendant's conduct is causing and unless enjoined by this court will continue to cause us great and irreparable injury. So we need relief on an equitable basis. Then we have contributory and inducement liability for unauthorized reproduction of protected works. This is where we get a little bit more far afield here. This is saying, okay, you induce the people that actually are pirating to pirate by having this thing made available to you. This is maybe a, a little bit more uh, of a difficult case to make than even anything else we've discussed so far. Section 106 of the Copyright Act provides in pertinent part the author, the owner of a copyright under the Copyright Act has the exclusive right to reproduce its works. Plaintiff owns valid registered copyrights in Nintendo games. Plaintiff expects discovery to reveal that many of its copyrighted games have been infringed by Yuzu users and developers. Nintendo has not licensed its rights to the defendant or otherwise provided authorization for defendant or its agents to exercise any of Nintendo's exclusive rights in its copyrighted games. In case you were confused, Your Honor, Yuzu is not a licensed project. On information and belief, Yuzu users have dumped Nintendo games they have lawfully purchased into Yuzu and to obtain Nintendo games online from pirate websites and copy those game ROMs into Yuzu. Each such reproduction constitutes a violation. And here Nintendo's combining these two areas that might or might not be successful as we've talked about, uh, but certainly they're concerned most predominantly with the pirates, co pirated copies. Uh, users making infringing copies of Nintendo's copyrighted games on unauthorized platforms when they play those games on such platforms. Unauthorized copies of Nintendo games' audiovisual content are made dynamically during Yuzu's operations, including as the game content is decrypted. Additionally, Yuzu copies a game's audiovisual assets if a user opts to dump the game's ROMFS directory, as described in paragraph 56 above. Defendant has knowledge of Yuzu's users' direct infringement and materially contributes to each of their acts of infringement because it designs and provides them with the technology that enables the play of unauthorized game copies on unauthorized platforms, that is, Yuzu. Additionally, defendant induces that infringement because defendant has engaged in purposeful conduct that encourages and intended to encourage those users to make infringing copies of Nintendo's copyrighted games on unauthorized platforms and to play those games on such platforms. And here's where we get more of that kind of Ars Technica feel, which is to say Nintendo is just against uh, any emulation as it stands on the whole, right? Yuzu itself uh, is illegal. And it, it might be for the reasons we've talked about, but not just because it is emulating a Switch. As such, defendant is secondarily liable for each act of infringement performed by Yuzu users. This is the kind of thing that I do think can possibly get kicked out of court at the very early stages, right? That, that Yuzu is responsible for all the piracy of its users. Seems like it's probably going a bit too far under the laws that we've looked at in the precedent that exists today. So this is one that Yuzu will probably fight the strongest and I suspect is likely to fall away from the court case. But that doesn't mean that the whole case is gone. Uh, the judge, a court can decide whether to summarily dismiss the entire case, none of the case, parts of the case. This is the kind of thing that I think is probably harder to bring for Nintendo than some of the other areas of law. As a direct and proximate result of the defendant's violations of 17 U.S.C. 501, 
Plaintiff is entitled to the maximum statutory damages pursuant to 504 in the amount of $150,000 with respect to each copyrighted work or such other amounts as may be proper under 504. In the alternative, plaintiff is entitled to its actual damages as well as to defendant's profits from these violations in amounts to be proven at trial. And again, we ask for equitable relief. What does that include? For such equitable relief under Title 17 and 28, and this court's inherent equitable powers, the ability of the court to force people to do things or refrain to, from doing them, as is necessary to prevent or restrain defendants further violations of these laws, including a permanent injunction prohibiting defendant and its officers, agents, servants, employees, attorneys, and all third parties in active concert or participation with any of them from manufacturing, offering to the public, providing or otherwise trafficking in the Yuzu emulator, infringing or causing, enabling, facilitating, encouraging, promoting, and inducing or participating in the infringement of Nintendo's works, enjoining defendant and all third parties with notice of the order from supporting or facilitating access to all or any domain names, URLs, websites, chat rooms, and other social media websites or applications through which defendant traffics in the Yuzu emulator or other circumvention devices and prohibiting defendant from engaging in any other violation of the DMCA or the Copyright Act. For entry of an order pursuant to those various things and this court's inherent equitable powers requiring defendant and its officers, agents, and various other third parties uh, to surrender and cease to use the domain names and any variant thereof controlled by defendant to immediately transfer the domain names to Nintendo and in joining defendant and all third parties with notice of the order from supporting or facilitating access to any of these various things. So Nintendo says we need damages. We need you to stop them through an enjoining procedure. And then you need to hand over all of the access points to Nintendo. And I think, again, whenever you see equitable powers asked for, these are the most unlikely to be granted because that's the court at its furthest reaches of power. Uh, not because of what Nintendo says, not because of what anybody would say in a pleading. It's just the hardest thing for a court to do. And I don't see them very likely having full authority to take control of the domains and everything else. But it is possible, depending on exactly how much Nintendo were to win in court on these various points. And again, as we've said, as part of this video, a lot of this is more complicated than the internet might have you believe. And that's why I wanted to talk with you all about it for a number of hours here already. So they ask for all these various things and then you get to the end. Now that's 41 pages for a legal pleading. I have to be honest with you. It's actually pretty svelte for this kind of document. I know that took us a little while to get through, but I wanted to get through it all because I think it's important. Uh, and it is pretty, pretty well documented. I think, I think it's not as crazy as some of the other things we have read through in virtual legality. And to my mind, this is the kind of thing that can survive summary dismissal and create problems for an emulator creator, which is why I gave a few quotes to verge here. Uh, uh, and again, this was early on, but I think it's still follows through from all my further research on these points. Nintendo sues Switch emulator Yuzu for facilitating piracy at a colossal scale. Nintendo isn't alleging Yuzu stole the keys, but says it's all about piracy. And we see here as summarized by The Verge, aren't emulators legal? Well, yes and no. While there's legal precedent that suggests it's okay to reverse engineer a console and develop an emulator that uses none of the company's source code, those cases are roughly a quarter of a century old or more. It gets trickier when we're talking about multiple layers of modern encryption and the copyrighted BIOSes that Yuzu and other modern emulators require to run. Indeed it does, right? Because the DMCA is entered into at about the same time as those cases and really didn't apply in the same way as we look at today. And a lot of the engineering that's been done on these consoles is based on the premise that you put in these technological measures and if someone is circumventing them, that's its own violation of the law rather than just a blanket copyright infringement. So when we look at something like the Switch or the PlayStation or the Xbox, we can expect them to be a little bit more protected than those earlier systems based on the use of this law and, and how they've been constructed. The Dolphin emulator for Nintendo Wii and GameCube got in enough hot water to abandon its plan to launch on Steam when it was revealed that Dolphin ships with Nintendo Wii's common key to help circumvent the copyright protection on Wii games. And Dolphin maintains that that including that key is legal. Again, this is an unknown legal position, right? Nintendo doesn't allege that Yuzu includes any such keys, though. Yuzu takes a bring-your-own-bios approach, expecting users to either lift their own BIOSes and keys off a hacked Nintendo Switch using a loophole that Nintendo eliminated in its newer models, or more likely, says The Verge, not just Nintendo here, download a pirated one. And happy Final Fantasy VII Rebirth Day to those of you who celebrate. I'm very excited about that release today, uh, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I hope I enjoy it. So we will see on that. We get various other bits of this article. And then we see quotes from this guy named Hogue, who I'm not sure we should believe, but he says, I'd say the claim here is enough to get a reasonable emulator company to cease to assist and settle claims. You've heard that from me already. But remember that this is only one side of the story at present. Yuzu didn't immediately respond to requests for its side of the story on Discord and via email. And here you can see a copy of this 
presented on The Verge directly. A link to this article will be present on the podcast page of this video, not on the YouTube channel directly because YouTube doesn't like links anymore and it sends me some nasty grams through email. So we will be linking our various articles and other points referenced through the podcast page. Please do check that out if you're interested in these things. Uh, and thank you so much for being here. We're not quite done yet. So let's look a little bit further. I did want to highlight a few things, one of which is David Hollinger, whose name you've seen in Super Chats already today. I'm very glad that they're here to watch this video, hopefully get any questions they have answered. But they were asking me a number of questions in various places over the past few days, and I really like that. I really like these kinds of interactions, and hopefully I can help them here. So David Hollinger asks, when I post a little bit about this on social media, what about the video game preservation exception that was added by the Library of Congress, referring to the 1201 Library of Congress process, and the jailbreaking exception as well? Or does jailbreaking only apply to Apple devices? And the good news is jailbreaking doesn't only apply to Apple devices, David, and we'll take a look at what it does apply to. The bad news is it definitely doesn't apply to video game consoles, and we'll see why is part of that discussion in just a second. So when we look at how this is presented by the Library of Congress, you see what looks a lot like a set of laws, right? And if you were to say, Rick, I thought Congress made the laws, not the Library of Congress. Uh, I would say, yes, you're probably right. This appears to be a delegation of uh, congressional authority that maybe has gone a little far at this point. That's a political question. And for more political folks than I, that said, we can look at what is accepted from the operation of that circumvention provision, right? Remembering from the beginning of this video that the Library of Congress was charged with providing exceptions to the overall prohibition on circumvention of technological measures where they think that most uses would be essentially non-infringing uh, for purposes of this, right? Congress says, well, some people have come to us and said this provision might prevent legitimate non-infringing use of copyrighted materials or fair use, as we've heard it discussed before. And we don't really want to do that, but we don't know what it is we're talking about. We don't know what future technology will look like. So Library of Congress, here, every three years, go and figure out what should be exempted from this rule based on whatever factors you consider appropriate. Say, okay, the Library of Congress says, that sounds like a good job. That's going to take us a little work. And they've been working every three years since this law was passed to reevaluate exactly what should be in this particular exception principle. And we can see some of these. Computer programs that enable wireless devices to connect to a wireless telecommunications network when circumvention is undertaken solely in order to connect to a wireless telecommunications network and such connection is authorized by the operator of such network. So what is that in non-legalese? That's jailbreaking your cell phone to go to a different provider, right? We know this is allowed because we see people doing it and we see uh, folks referencing how to do it. That's allowed by virtue of this provision. Otherwise, it wouldn't be allowed, right? Otherwise, you are cracking into a operating system on your phone that is otherwise technologically protected to do something that the people that own that operating system don't want you to be doing. And so that wouldn't be allowed. The Library of Congress says, no, it should be allowed because we want to foster innovation in telecommunications networks. We want to foster competition in those things as well. So the librarian says, no, that should be allowed. Next, computer programs that enable smartphones and portable all-purpose mobile computing devices to execute lawfully obtained software applications, right? You can crack your cell phone in order to get apps on it that the provider of that cell phone doesn't otherwise want you to have access to. Again, jailbreaking for cell phones. But I've highlighted here, note, all-purpose mobile computing devices, right? You want to say this applies to a switch. A switch is not all-purpose. A portable all-purpose mobile computing device is a device that is primarily designed to run a wide variety of programs rather than for consumption of a particular type of media content. Now, is this great legal language? No, I don't think so because... The Switch runs a wide variety of programs. They're just all video games. Is equipped with an operating system prim primarily designed for mobile use and is intended to be carried or worn by an individual. So this is designed to not apply to video game consoles, and we'll see why in just a second. Uh, but that's jailbreaking. So when I'm asked the question about jailbreaking, it specifically applies to all-purpose mobile computing devices and specifically to cell phones. They, they've been enhanced with this mobile computing devices to kind of incorporate tablets and that kind of notion, but it's really designed around cell phones. When we get to video games, we see some other limitations. What is accept, accepted from this limitation on circumvention? Video games in the form of computer programs embodied in physical or downloaded formats that have been lawfully acquired as complete games when the copyright owner or its authorized representative has ceased to provide access to an external computer server necessary to, necessary to facilitate an authentication process. So what does this mean in normal speak? It's video games that require a call home, right? It's those that have a, a, a beep that go and ask an authentication server to confirm that it's yours. Uh, you are allowed to crack that if uh, they essentially shut that down, right? 
if it's necessary for the sole purpose of permitting access to the video game to allow copying and modification of the computer program to restore access to the game for personal local gameplay on a personal computer or video game console. Your copy of that game that requires an authentication server beep is allowed to be cracked open and you're allowed to spoof that particular authentication if it's necessary to play your game, but not for other reasons. Permitting access to the video game to allow copying and modification of the cop computer program to restore access to the game on a personal computer or video game console when necessary to allow preservation, great, by an eligible library, archives, or museum, right? So this is not the kind of personal use case. Personal use is covered above, but when we're talking about just general preservation, archival, the Library of Congress says, no, it's not for you individuals. It's for eligible libraries, archives, or museums. And there's certain rules that make you eligible for that purpose. Computer programs used to operate video game consoles solely to the extent necessary for an eligible library, archives, or museum to engage in preservation activities. And the following definition shall apply. Cease to provide access means that the copyright owner or its authorized representative has either issued an affirmative statement indicating that external server support for the video game has ended and such support is in fact no longer available, or alternatively, server support has been discontinued for a period of at least months, six months, provided, however, that the support has not since been restored. So this is specifically archival of games that call home so that you can play them on your personal computer or that a library or museum can preserve them in whatever form they're looking to preserve them. It is not kind of broader than that. Making the point a little bit more explicit, computer programs accept video games, right? They took special effort to make sure that in this case, computer programs, which we've talked about, probably includes video games for purposes of 117 is not included here in this exception to the circumvention rules. Computer programs accept video games that have been lawfully acquired and that are no longer re reasonably available in the commercial marketplace solely for the purpose of lawful preservation of a computer program by an eligible library, archives, or museum. So video games come up again and again. And one of the things that has happened is that folks have said, okay, you've got these general computing notions, but what about cracking open consoles? And the latest we see that discussion being had is 2015. So again, they look at this every three years, right? And we see proposed class 19. This is a proposed class of exceptions. Manish Pangasa filed a petition proposing an exemption to permit circumvention of those technological protection measures on home video game consoles for an assortment of asserted non-infringing uses, including installing alternative operating systems and removing region locks. Such circumvention is often referred to as jailbreaking. In general, access controls on video game consoles prevent the use of unauthorized video games. Region locks prevent the console from playing games from outside a particular geographic territory. As discussed below, a similar exemption was considered and rejected in 2012. Why? Due to concerns about video game piracy. And we'll see that exact same argument being used by the Librarian of Congress in 2015 to reject this class on the whole. So we're going to scan ahead a little bit. So it's a good idea. We'd be able to repair our consoles, these various things. The opposition, including the ESA, right? The people that make the video games says, no, it's a problem because jailbreaking leads to piracy. The Librarian of Congress says in 2012, the register determined that access controls on gaming consoles protect not only the console firmware, but the video games and applications that run on the console as well, many of which are owned by the console manufacturers. Based on extensive record evidence provided by opponents in that proceeding, the register concluded that the circumvention of console restrictions, even when initially undertaken for salutary purposes, legal ones, is inextricably linked to and tends to foster piracy, right? So the Librarian of Congress is charged with finding exceptions, and they basically say, okay, maybe consoles should be allowed to be emulated in this fashion by virtue of the way these things work and by virtue of fair use and the precedents that we have before us, but we are not going to specifically exempt consoles from this rule because to do so would be to foment essentially related infringement like piracy. And you can see that's exactly what Nintendo has pled, right? Nintendo takes this concept that we just looked at from the Librarian of Congress and says, that's what's happening here. If you allow this, it foments this piracy. It's this huge infringement problem. And maybe even if our argument is a bit of a stretch on the specifics to the way we're operating it, you're still preventing this horrible thing. The Librarian of Congress and the various other people that have put these laws in place we're trying to prevent this kind of follow on infringement. That's another reason why I think that Nintendo has pled a decent case here. And it's it's one thing that I wanted to highlight when asked these questions that video game consoles have been considered. Video game consoles have specifically been rejected for most of these exceptions for exactly the reasons that Nintendo is pleading. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them. Doesn't mean you have to be happy that this is the state of the world or how the Librarian of Congress sees things, but it is the state of the world right now. And I wanted to make that clear as we have this discussion. And I thank everybody so much for being here. 
and for supporting the channel through player Patreon, just having comments, like this video if you liked it, share it around if you can, memberships, super chats, everything is helpful. And thank you so, so much to Karen Paulson for sponsoring today's episode. Now, as promised, we can do some questions and comments here. I want to answer any questions I can. I suspect Mr. Hollinger might have some additional comments and questions that I'd be happy to get to. Now, let's see if that is, in fact, the case. It is. So let's see if what we've got here. David Hollinger, didn't the Connectix case address the other markets question already? In part, but the DMCA comes in and adds another layer on top of that. Right, so the DMCA wasn't a consideration in the Connectix case or the earlier uh, in, in emulation cases, and so that adds another layer. And a lot of lawyers have thought for a considerable amount of time that 1201 comes in and basically makes all those emulation precedents a little bit moot because any decent console manufacturer is going to have those technological measures put in place, and so either the Library of Congress is going to get various emulators out of that or they aren't. And since the Library of Congress has rejected that argument, as we just saw, then that puts emulator creators in a bit of a pickle because Nintendo and anyone else with their salt is going to have those technological measures in place. I hope that helps. I really do. I know it's confusing. I know there's a lot of movements left and right as we go through all these exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions. So I hope this is a helpful video and it informs and educates as I intend. So thank you so much for all the support of the channel, for all the great questions, David. Uh, and I hope I'm being helpful here. Uh, I really am trying. Uh, Karen L. Muscoso, thank you for being a member so long. Glad I didn't miss the live. I love the Lawyers and Dragons uh, brains uh, cap there in their profile picture. Early morning meetings are the worst. That's true. Going back to the beginning, thank you for breaking this down. I really appreciate you being a member. Thank you so much for supporting the cha channel. And I'll get your name pronunciation right, I promise. Justin doesn't look at. Thank you so much for the super chat. Thanks for the coverage, Hogue. I feel like the overall zeitgeist is turning against emulation. It's a shame because archival mods and randomizers are super important. I like preservation, right? I want video games to be preserved. I don't think the industry has done a good job of that. I think emulators are a partial solve to that. And I did want to answer uh, one question that I saw online raised by a, a couple of people, which is asking the question, if Nintendo wins on this, does that mean there'd be a problem for Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo having their own emulators, right? We see on the Switch that there is a Nintendo 64 emulator and they publish various things through that. The answer to that is likely no, because you can always license the rights to these various things. And to the extent those are published by the company themselves, they can just uh, assign those intellectual property rights as might be needed to create those emulations within their company. But that's also the answer to the question of why when you see Nintendo having their Nintendo Online uh, product like an SNES, you see their games more often than not and not necessarily all the other big games, right? You don't see a a Final Fantasy VI necessarily on there, even though that's one of their most popular products from the SNES era. You see the things that they themselves created or the things that they clearly have a licensing arrangement with. I think Capcom is involved in a number of those games. You see Breath of Fire and things like that. So you see those companies behind the scenes, even if you don't see it from afar, going through contracting of the intellectual property to bring those things to emulation. Uh, and to the extent that they don't, that might be a problem for Nintendo's argument, but you don't see those companies generally trying to do that in the long run in any event. So I think the zeitgeist maybe is turning against it a little bit. I do think maybe that is a shame. Part of that is because there are these bad actors on the fringes of some of this stuff, right? If every emulator was just operating through personally owned archival ROM dumps or things like that, you might see the laws change a little bit. The law is sometimes a reflection of the realities of the world, right? Which is to say Nintendo is arguing, okay, Yuzu might be okay on the law uh, in certain places of that pleading, but they darn well know that a lot of people that are not okay with the law are using it for nefarious purposes. And that means that this needs to be pulled back. That might not be the strongest argument, excuse me. But for a court that's being asked to use its equitable powers and is looking at who the bad actor is and, and what the result is on the ground, that is something that could potentially work, even if it's not as kind of programmatic as here's the violation and here's the law. Saffron City TV, thank you so much for the super chat. So glad you're covering this, Hogue. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I love covering this kind of stuff. I'm sorry that I haven't gotten to do it as often as I would like in the past couple of years. But I intend to keep trying to do this in this space. And I think virtual legality is an important part of the conversation, hopefully. I think we've gotten to that point, And I hope that it is helpful to everybody that has questions on these topics. David Hollinger, thank you for the super chat. There could be an argument made that decryption is a form of authentication. Well, because it actually is a form of authentication. Sure. 
it is definitely a form of authentication. I mean, I think the underlying problem that people have when they talk about this issue is that that DMC-1201 is so broadly written that virtually anything that we talk about today with respect to operating systems or how system software actually works is going to have a technological prevention mechanism put in place. And so it basically means as a law that emulation was prohibited at some fundamental level. And people are going to have an issue with that. And I don't necessarily think they're wrong. But that's 1201 as it stands today. And somebody bringing a case on 1201 is not that big of a surprise. So let's see if I can get my voice back here. The issue with third-party companies using emulators is that they tend to use the very software they are fighting against. The issue with third-party companies using emulators is that they tend to use the very software they are fighting against. I think that's probably true, right? When we talk about companies using emulators, uh, they are using versions of the things that they would otherwise cut down with an argument like the Nintendo's if they could. And we see that in various places. I think the Nintendo's of the world could build their own emulators. I think they have to some extent for their Nintendo online service. But there is value to be had from these various companies that have figured out how to emulate this software perhaps even better than they would internally, right? Uh, and so that is an issue with third-party companies. Thank you, David, for all the many super chats. I really appreciate it. I hope that I have answered some of your questions on all this. Zmore76 asks, can Nintendo sell their own games that have previously been pirated? Game gets uploaded and lightly modified by the pirater. Then Nintendo downloads that and sells that through their emulator. Um, can Nintendo sell their own games that have previously been pirated? Yeah, well, the thing about pirating something or making an illegal derivative work off of something is that that person that's made that work is never the rightful copyright holder of that thing, right? We talked about this a little bit with respect to fan creations of video games or even drawings of Sonic the Hedgehog that Sega winds up using in its E3 presentation and things like that, right? So it's always going to be tricky when somebody that doesn't have the intellectual property rights does something with it, and then the copyright owner wants to use it for some reason or another. That copyright owner is generally going to have a better position under the law than the party that intervened and did something that was not otherwise legally uh, uh, allowed. It doesn't make it fair. It doesn't make that just necessarily, but people that are engaged in piracy, certainly, but even making derivatives of other things that they don't own should be aware of that situation. David says they specifically use the projects they dislike. I don't know that, honestly. I haven't seen that, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. Sorry about that. Thank you, everybody. All right. Okay. And you're just clarifying. Absolutely. I appreciate the help. I'm pretty sure every Nintendo emulator they use themselves is developed by Nerd, Nintendo Europe Research and Development. I think that's right. I think the, the copyrights that I remember seeing show Nintendo copyrights on those pages. But I do think that there are other instances that we can see in video gaming where somebody has borrowed essentially a successful emulator in order to get done what they want to get done with whatever their remaster is on a various system. So I think it's a fair question to say, hey, if all of these things are voided if nintendo wins this case is that something that has tailing effects for what amounts to an industry of emulator creators and could the industry actually shoot itself in the foot a little bit on these things if they're otherwise using the efforts of modders and creators and open source folks that they could have done uh they could have grabbed and used themselves and instead are forced to internally research and develop these things i can't answer that these are questions that are going to be raised in the long run but i don't know Hello, darkness, my old friend, says Hoagland. Let's talk about PlayStation laying off 100 people. Man, I almost said yesterday that I would have to start a layoff playlist, right? Because we did the Xbox Ones a couple of weeks ago, and then PlayStation had one a couple of days ago, and then Electronic Arts is cutting off a couple hundred people. I mean, that's the state of the industry right now. That is the state of technology on the whole. It's not limited to video games. It's where the economy is post-pandemic and exactly what the margins are on these game sales. It is certainly a conversation we could have. Um, but I have not jumped into the layoff bucket just yet. There's actually about six things I have on my list here. PlayStation layoffs is number one. Nintendo versus Yuzu came up over the last couple of days. I've got one on Remedy taking control of the control intellectual property. Call of Duty antitrust case. Got lots of stuff on the list. 
Uh, but we'll see what I can get to and when. I also want to keep up with Hangouts and Headlines. So I appreciate the recommendation. Layoffs is certainly one of those things that I would love to mention a little bit more often. I think it's worthwhile for people to have empathy for those that help create all of the wonderful things in this hobby we love so much. David Hollinger says, Hogue devs have found remnants of open source emulators in the Nintendo and Microsoft emulators. The Nintendo 64 emulator in Switch Online was forked from one of the Nintendo 64 open source projects. That doesn't surprise me, right? You don't want to reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Uh, and so it is an important part of this conversation is to say, is Nintendo even making a logical decision by fighting use you this much? I think they certainly feel harmed by its existence. Uh, but they probably don't want to eliminate the entire emulator creation market on the whole because it is useful for these companies to grow and grab these various things when they want to start putting these things on their own services. So I think it's a totally fair point. Chris asks, Ho, did you hear that Embracer plans to sell Saber Interactive? I did not hear that yet, but Embracer is one of those stories that I wish I could cover more. I wish it had a little bit more kind of specific points in time that it made sense to do a full video on because they're clearly a roll-up endeavor, which if you're in the kind of capital side of things, you recognize as a company that goes and grabs other companies in an effort to increase their value as a group and sell them on to someone else that didn't work out, right? The middle point of that project where they were supposed to get funding to move those in and then move them out fell through. And now they're kind of scrambling and trying to figure out how to get those back on the market because they don't actually have a plan for them long term. That's an interesting story, right? I think that is an interesting, fascinating story. Unfortunately, many, many lives are affected by that. Many game projects and certainly a lot of the output from these companies are affected by that in a negative way. But I think it's a fascinating story from a business perspective, and I wish I could cover it a little bit more. So thank you for letting me know, Chris. Raphael Hogue, if Nintendo wins this case, as it is, what repercussions could you see happening to other emulator platforms? I think that what you'd get is the precedent set that just not including the keys is not significant enough to keep you legal, right? So I think you'd see a lot more strenuous trying to separate the emulator from piracy, right? You'd see more specifically policing of that or attempts to police that by the emulator creators that don't participate in the Reddit on piracy, don't otherwise reference those things on Discord and say, this is specifically for use of legal ROMs on your own, not for piracy. Any any indication of piracy will immediately terminate your right to use the emulator, right? You might have some kind of remote check if possible. I think that's likely to happen uh, if Nintendo were to just straight up win this case, because I think that's what will ultimately lose it for Yuzu is some of those lines from Bunny in the Discord about piracy, knowing that it's pir uh, piracy-based and that the, the quick start guide is not sufficient enough on its own when you know that piracy is the only real thing that you're, you're going to be facilitating. So I think that's probably what would wind up happening if this were to go along the lines. But I think it's far more likely to settle, right? If it survives a motion for summary dismissal, at that point, Yuzu really is, if they are reasonably operated, and you can never, you can never promise that because people are people, if it's reasonably operated, they probably are going to listen to a cease and desist and otherwise settle for some amount of money that would be less than the overall risk that they have, plus whatever the lawyers would cost for that entire thing. So thank you for asking the question. Again, if anybody else has other questions, you can see the super chats are not required. Uh, they're helpful and they help support the channel, but I do try to capture anything that has a Q or a Hogue law on it if I can. Hogue, are there implications on Microsoft who uses an N64 emulator in re Rare Replay if Nintendo wins? I think it depends on exactly who has the rights to the g underlying games. I got to believe Rare and Microsoft have the rights to the underlying games in Rare Replay. The N64 emulator uh, itself might have another kind of practical examination, right? N64 is prior to the time when we would have been looking at DMCA technological circumvention measures. So is it the kind of thing that you could have the same argument with the Switch and Yuzu? I don't know how the N64 operates on a security basis, on a technological basis to know that. But could there be implications? There are always implications. Could it scuttle that project or otherwise make it unavailable? I think that's a little bit more unlikely. Joshua Ford, question, what do you think led Nintendo to target Yuzu specifically and not Ryujinx? The popularity, the Discord discussion, something else? I don't know what emulators in the Nintendo Switch laboratories are the most popular. If Yuzu is the most popular, I suspect you just go down the line, right? You, you, you hit the biggest one first. And then you go from there. So I don't know Ryujinx. I didn't know Yuzu before this conversation. Uh, so I think it's popularity there. Discord discussions are certainly helpful, right? But you can tell Nintendo 
was in that Discord for a long, long time, right? They have quotes from May of last year. They have quotes seemingly from before then on some things that were mentioned in the Discord. So not only were they there, but they had grabbed those conversations from whenever they happened uh, a long time ago. So they were already prepping that. And that's kind of normal for a corporation to follow these various things if they think they're going to have a legal claim at some point in the future. So this is just the day that they decided to do it. But I think this was always something that Nintendo was planning to do if and when they felt they had enough of a position to do it. I also think you're seeing that this is happening towards the end of the Switch lifespan, both because the Nintendo Switch is not going to be their primary product going into the future, and also to try to set maybe a little precedent for the next go around, right? What is Bunny's next project? What is Yuzu 2? What is the Super Switch version of Yuzu? And maybe you get this person who's a thorn in your paw at Nintendo to consider not making an emulator for your next product or to do it in a way that you feel is better able to prevent piracy for your system. So this is a moment in time where Nintendo is facing an inflection point. We saw this happen with the Wii and the Wii U, right? Where Nintendo did not survive with the same market share after the Wii. The Wii U was mostly considered to be a disaster in terms of sales. And so Nintendo is trying to have this transition continue its pace from the Switch and is trying to take steps to protect itself from when that transition occurs. That's how I see it, at least. I suspect that's how the business folks see it at Nintendo, but we're speculating, of course. David Hollinger says, the problem is no one cracked the switch. The workaround was a built-in functionality of the Tegra chip. Users were just using that functionality. Right, and that's one that they protected against after the 2018 editions. Is that what they said uh, in their pleading, I think? And, and the cracking, the hacking, getting around these various things is going to be part of the conversation, right? This is after we get through summary dismissal that Nintendo plausibly pled something that is illegal, you start getting those tests. Is this the kind of thing that actually was a circumvention? Is that an effective control measure? These are the things that come up in a case uh, if it gets to the court level. And those are the things we can't answer specifically, but probably neither party can either. And so they start to look at settlement really, really carefully. Rob says, upon a cursory glance, the Yuzu source appears to show that they use OpenSSL for decryption, a third-party library. Does this affect Nintendo's technological circumvention claim? Uh, in the fact that it might not be effective control of their copyrighted materials, right? These are the tests that will absolutely come up at the court level. These are the fights that you will have is if Nintendo pled something that is potentially illegal, and I think that they did, that gets them past summary dismissal. When you actually test these things in court, you get into questions about, did you actually meet this requirement that your technological measure is a... a means to scramble a scrambled work, decrypt an encrypted work, or otherwise avoid, bypass, remove, deactivate, or impair a technological method with, without the authority of a copyright owner? And are you a measure that in the ordinary course of operation requires the application of information uh, with the authority of the copyright owner to gain access to the work, right? And I think that's going to be a fight, depending on whether or not the decryption is sufficient, exactly where it's coming from, what libraries are being used to get access to it. If they just left themselves open to a massive hole, then I've seen court decisions in the past say that wasn't an effective control measure as it stands. And that might be the case, right? Again, on a technology basis, I can't answer that question. I don't really think lawyers can answer that question generally. They get the information from their clients and they put them in pleadings like this one or they defend it from information from their clients if you're on the user side of the things. But the lawyers themselves are not the experts in how the security infrastructure works. I would also add, however, that judges are not either. And so what you're looking at is a little bit of jousting as to how you describe these various things. You saw Nintendo describe it as unlawful all over the place. That was a, a rhetorical device to try to put that in the mind of the court. And I think certainly if it's not an effective control measure, that's the kind of thing that can win you the, the, th the argument at the end of the day. But you have to go through that whole trial process to get to that point in time. Joshua Ford says, Hogue, one thing about these Discord communities is that you can go back to see older messages prior to joining. wonder if these communities will get closed off as a result of stuff like this. Certainly possible. Uh, is Discord not a service? And I apologize for not knowing this answer up front. Is Discord not a service where you can turn it so that you don't see things before you joined or that you have destruction of messages after a week or two? Does Discord not have those options? Because if they don't, I do think that communities might move into things that are more maybe end-to-end -end encrypted, more... Uh, a bit of able to tell who's accessing information or not, because these communities do want to operate with information for their people. But they don't want to give that information to the Nintendos of the world who are lurking in that Discord server themselves. So that's a good question, Joshua. I don't know the answer to it. I honestly didn't know that Discord doesn't have that functionality if it doesn't, because I don't use Discord that often. 
David Hollinger. Hogue, one last question. I'd be curious to know how the fact that the switch workaround wasn't such but built-in functionality of the Tegra chip, chip affects any arguments, if at all. I think it, it comes back down to whether it's an effective control of the access to the copyrighted work, right? It, even if it's a known functionality, it does depend on how that information is getting out there and what tool sets are needed to be used for these various things. So I do think Nintendo pleads a case there. When you start getting into the actual functionality of these things, you'd get into a battle of the experts, you'd get into various pleadings from both parties. And I think to the extent that you describe it as a uh, built-in functionality, that could be a problem for them. I can't answer that specifically on my own. Sorry about that. Joshua Ford says, question, I don't get how archival works in the law when it comes to computer programs. Is the archive work just whatever copy you don't use? Uh, an archived work would be a, a fully functional copy of a complete software program that essentially sits in the background. And you can use it, uh, but you can't probably transfer it to a different system functionality. Uh, that's not archival, right? If you have a copy of Word on your computer and you want to copy it for archival purposes, first you'd want to check your license terms and things like that. Uh, but you would um, you would have it on your system and then you could use either one but you can't just make it a Word version that works on your PlayStation, probably, would be my guess. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure there's a lot of strong precedent on these things one, one way or the other. There certainly isn't for video games, I don't think. Uh, so ultimately, archival is a term of art, and it's not one that's terribly well-defined in the law as it stands. And so you don't really want to lean on the exceptions to copyright infringement if you can avoid it, but they are there, and I wanted to highlight them as part of this video. David Hollinger. Rob Farley, second, at Hogla. I'm not sure how this plays out. OpenSSL is used all over games and tech to encrypt information, but that also means anyone with the keys can decrypt it. Yeah, and, I, and that's certainly a worthy part of the conversation, right? Okay, yes, we have an encryption feature, but it's not this CIA level end-to-end -end thing that uh, is going to keep everybody out. We could have done that. We didn't. So it's not an effective control, argues Yuzu, and maybe that's an effective argument in court. And Nintendo says, all right, well, we got to use a higher level of encryption on the next one or what have you, right? Even if they don't win this case, that's still useful information for them on how to engineer the Switch 2. So that's a part of this as well. Thank you so much. Rob Frawley says, Hogue Fair, thank you for your thoughts. I'm always happy to help. I hope I have been a help. Thank you so much for being here and for asking good questions. David, I think Yuzu has already implemented the requirement for a phone number for new users or something. Makes sense. I, I, I don't know. Uh, and they're having a conversation in the chat. And if anybody else has a question, please do mark it with a Q or an at Hogla. Uh, David Hollinger, Hogla, I lied. I, you know, that's not a lie if you meant it at the time. One final question. What's the likelihood that there is a settlement and the user dev continues under a different name? I don't know that they would have to change their name. I do think there will be a settlement because I do think Nintendo has pled enough to get through that preliminary dismissal stage. I will say this. We haven't seen what Yuzu's defense document is, so we don't know what that looks like. I suspect they have some strong arguments, as many people have pointed out in this chat and comments on my emails and DMs. Uh, so I think they will survive that summary dismissal. And then I think settlement starts to look really attractive for a company like Yuzu. But you never know, right? This individual, Bunny or someone else that operates that company, could just really want to get into a legal fight on these things. And these are still people. And that can wind up in a lawsuit. But I think the likelihood is high that there's a settlement. And I think the likelihood is high that various emulators continue to exist in the world, perhaps operating a little bit differently for those that want to try to comply uh, if Yuzu winds up getting shut down or otherwise uh, har harmed by Nintendo's action against them. Joshua Ford says, Hoax, you could theoretically copy a prod key for use on a Steam Deck as long as you then don't use the Switch as it stays the archived form. Well, theoretically, the, the, the prod key... Uh, is is what in that case an archival copy of what you've got on your on your own system? So that's not a complete product. If we go and we look at the if we look at the actual section in question, we're talking about uh, full computer programs, right? Exact copies, that kind of thing, specifically for archival. So I don't know that that would work. But again, you're asking kind of legal questions, and I do want to point out this will be at the end of the video as well. This is not a video for legal advice. It's informational or educational purposes only. I don't know what Joshua Ford intends to do with anything, but if you were to do anything with any of these th questions, ROMs, what have you, you would want to consult your own legal counsel. Certainly, I think you know that, but I want to make sure it's clear for everybody. David Hollinger says, OpenSSL uses the CIA-level encryption algorithms to encrypt things. My point is that standard tools are used all over the industry, so I'm worried, curious as to the implications. Okay, I think I understand it a little bit better. Uh, but yes, it, 
that becomes a question of facts rather than law as to, okay, if, if widely available tools are out there to break this thing, does that change what an effective level of control is? And I'd argue that it shouldn't because you don't actually want to put the cost on the console creators of encryption of these things if they've used whatever is reasonable at the time. But a reasonable mind could argue with that point. That's what lawyers do. And so I don't know where that would wind up. But thank you for the clarity there. I appreciate it. Solid Python 2099. And then I think I have to wrap it up pretty soon because we're we're coming up on what? A couple hours? More than a couple hours. And I want to make sure that I get to the actual lawyering today. Solid Python 2099. Hogue, do you think Nintendo has a stronger argument in front of the judge since the emulator in question is used to pirate currently available software, making the archival argument moot? I don't think the archival argument is moot. I certainly think it's a stronger argument for the current for the current system that is out there, but it's not a non-existent argument even for prior systems. Because if we were to dive deeper into the Librarian of Congress thought patterns there and some other arguments that have been had about video game consoles on the whole, it is noted by basically every court that I have seen that unlike some other computer programs, there is a market for essentially retro games. And I think we recognize that. That's one of the reasons why people want preservation. And to the extent there is a market for those retro games, anybody that's emulating even an older system is potentially infringing on the copyright holders' rights to go and make money off of their re-release of those same games, right? So when you think of an emulator that allows you to play Wave Race 64, that's okay for Nintendo to release, but it might not have been okay for someone else to release, even though it's a really old game and probably doesn't compete on graphics or gameplay with things that are uh, made today, it's still something that the court is going to want to protect for the original copyright creator because there is value there. Rob Frawley, given a Nintendo win and the fact that Yuzu is open source, what tools can Nintendo use to destroy the thousands of copies of Yuzu source code across the internet and individual users' computers? Well, that's a fun part of this conversation, right? Nintendo does not have a realistic ability to stop the proliferation of Yuzu. They can go through the court system to try to get damages. They can go through the court system and try to get the creators of Yuzu as it stands to stop distributing it, but they can't really stop every instance of it out in the world. They know that. That's not the goal. Part of the goal of a case like this is to prevent the next Yuzu or to at least make the next Yuzu creators think about how they want to create it. It is not to necessarily obliterate every version of Yuzu on the planet Earth because that is not possible. As we know from things that hit the internet, it's very difficult to go and put that genie back in a bottle. All right, folks, I think I've hit all the questions. I think I actually, uh, I, uh, I think I'm all set. With that, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate it. I hope this was a useful video. Again, put your likes down there. Leave comments. Everything is helpful. And I will see you on the next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.